Lord. My Lord, um, may it please you, as before, I have here with Mr. George MacDonald, for the respondent, my learned friends, uh, Mr. Kirby, King's Council, and Mr. Robin Dunn, and for the intervener, the Law Society of England and Wales, Mr. David Holland, Q, a KC. Um, Mr. Rupert Cohen uh, can't appear today, but he remains my learned friends, Junior, and I understand he'll be in tomorrow after another commitment. Um, my Lord, before I say anything else, can I express my personal regret at the disruption that was caused by me being indisposed at the last hearing, and my thanks uh, to the bench for accommodating uh, that at the very last minute. So, of course, I do apologise. No need to apologise for COVID. <laughs> yes, well, I'd avoided it that far. It was extremely un uh, uh, un uh, inauspicious timing. Um, my, my Lord, so as you're aware, this appeal concerns the ability of solicitors conducting cases subject to fixed inter-parties costs to charge their clients sums which exceed those costs, and it's therefore of considerable importance to the legal services market, an importance that will grow as the proportion of cases subject to fixed inter-parties costs expands. Um, now, I, of course, am conscious that on the last occasion I'd substantially completed my submissions on the applicable legislation, but I'm equally conscious that one member of the court has changed. So, um, and, and also that at the, when the last hearing was put off, the master, my Lord the Master of Wales referred to it a start afresh. So unless the court prefers a different approach, I do propose to start, as a musician would say, da capo, um, whilst of course proceeding as economically as possible, especially on those points which two members of the court have heard before. Yes, uh, please do proceed uh, reasonably economically. Um, the court has done quite a lot, this court, has done quite a lot of work on this case, it being the third occasion for two of us and the second occasion for the third member of the court. Um, Mr. Williams, we've done a lot of work on this case. Um, and if it's any help to you, um, we do understand the facts and the background, although, of course, the way you want to put it is important. I mean, on one analysis, it would have been more logical for Mr. Kirby to go first on the section 74 point, but uh, you've obviously agreed amongst yourselves that you're going to go first on that. But I, I don't think you need to, um, r really, it's for him to make the case. So you might want to go pretty lightly on that and let him make the case and then maybe take a little more time in reply. Um, the only, the other point that is of particular concern to the court is the fiduciary duty point. Yes. And uh, that, I think, may require a little development. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's, um, that's really our thought. Um, obviously, you'll take your, your own course. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll listen with eager anticipation. Well, my Lord, I'm very, that, that, if I can respectfully say so, that's, that's very helpful. Um, and it may be that I'll speak to Mr. Kirby um, at um, lunchtime and we will uh, rejiggle the timetable so, so I get a slightly longer reply uh, mm. if, I go, if I proceed with a light touch on some of the points which your Lordship has identified. So uh, in terms of the, uh, the structure, a very brief um, uh, recapitulation of the um, figures. Um, uh, and in the light of what your Lordship has just said, second, a, a very brief review of the retainer documents and what they provide for. Um, and as aspect of that, I also propose to touch on the various other ways in which clients' rights are protected vis-a-vis -vis solicitors. But um, I think Mr. Holland for the Law Society is going to particularly focus on such things as the Ombudsman scheme and such like tomorrow. Um, then, then, then third, uh, some comments on the distinction between inter-parties costs and costs between solicitor and client, which we say is quite important and perhaps um, wasn't um, uh, uh, um, emphasised by me as much as it sh should have been last time. And then the, the core issues, um, first the analysis um, of the Solicitors Act um, and whether it applies to this case. That's issues one and two in the list of issues, and that's the contentious versus uncontentious business a dichotomy. Um, the consequences if Section 74.3 does not apply, that's a very short point because we essentially say there are no consequences. Um, and then a sixth, if contrary to my case, it does apply uh, whether the solicitors validly contracted out of it, and it's in the course of that we'll come to the fiduciary issues, which we didn't get to last time. And then lastly, the impact, if any, of the Consumer Rights Act. So, um, so far as the figures is con are concerned, at the last hearing, we handed up a one-page summary, which sadly didn't make it through to the bundles. It was redistributed yesterday, so I hope your Lordships have seen it. We've got it. I'm obliged. So I'm not going to take you through it again, but just the headline points 
the interface is if I at all times I'll ignore BAT. Um, the um, uh, um, the interface cost was five hundred pounds. The solicitors charged Ms. Belsner an additional three hundred and twenty one twenty five, which is about twenty percent of her compensation, uh, which was just over nineteen hundred pounds, leaving her with eighty percent of it. And on the face of it, we say that Ms. Belsner has absolutely nothing to complain about, and indeed she did complain about nothing for some time. Her solicitor spent over 13 months pursuing a claim on terms she paid nothing unless she recovered damages. Uh, damages were recovered and she's ended up keeping 80% of them, paying her solicitors less than £400 in her own pocket, even once VAT is accounted for. And on the unimpeached findings of the district judge, the sum paid to the solicitors is much less than the reasonable time cost of the work they faithfully did. Now, now the picture would look different, of course, if Miss Belsner had been led to believe that there would be no deduction from her damages, that her solicitors would limit their remuneration to the cost recovered from the defendant. But no one, least of all Ms. Belsner, has ever contended that that was the position. On the contrary, Ms. Belsner concedes that she was informed there would be deductions from her compensation if damages were recovered, and she agreed to that. She therefore has not challenged the deduction of the solicitor's success fee from her damages, that being a cost which, since the Jackson reforms, can never be recovered between the parties. So her objection is in fact limited to the solicitor's deduction of unrecovered costs from her compensation for success fee aside. And we do respectfully say it remains a curious feature of this case um, that both we and the Law Society have identified, and, and we do respectfully say that Ms. Belsner's representatives don't have a convincing answer, that, that, that those representatives concede that she effectively contracted with her solicitors for the success fee to be deducted. Uh, um, from her damages. That's one sort of, uh, of unrecovered costs. And there simply isn't uh, um, an intelligible explanation as to how the same agreement in the same instrument was somehow ineffective uh, for a different sort of unreco uh, unrecovered costs to be deducted. And that's a dichotomy um, I will come back to as necessary. Um, the mind was, we also... Sure can, uh, I'm, just, I'm not sure I quite understand that. Can you say that again, a bit more slowly? Of course, so I may is, have taken what your... What is this dichotomy? The, 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 the dichotomy is that it, it is accepted that the contractual instruments that were signed were efficient, uh, were effective to give, uh, if, and, and if, if, it, if it be necessary, an informed consent to the deduction of one category of unrecovered costs, namely her success fee. And, 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 and we say it's therefore diff difficult to understand a coherent case as to why it's the same document was ineffective not to authorise the deduction of another species of unrecovered costs, namely the difference between the fixed and parties' costs and the balance of her basic charges. And, 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 uh, and if it is being said that for some reason this contract fails to deliver uh, what it is said to deliver on the tin, then it's difficult to understand why it, it, it sort of delivers half of it but not the other half. Well, it might deliver it on the basis that the solicitors didn't tell her uh, that she was going to recover um, five hundred pounds when they knew that's what she was going to recover for her base costs, and um, that she was likely to incur charges that were five times that. Well, of course, they didn't know that's what she was going well, to recover because, their because there was, were a whole well, host of, of, of well, hang on a second, Mr. Williams. They they estimated her recovery at two and a half thousand pounds in damages, and they told her what the charges were going to be, and they told her what the success fee was going to but they did not say the crucial piece of information which is, and by the way, you're never going to recover uh, more than £500 uh, unless we start proceedings which we don't expect to have to do. Well, the evidence is not that that would have been the expectation because the evidence is that the vast majority of cases don't settle at stage two and one of the issues in this case is, is what, what is, is the vast majority? Well, I, I, I think the figure is something like 70% of cases at the time did, did not settle at stage two, but I can I come to the, the, we do have some figures available which we will come to. But, but, but one, of the, one of the mischaracterizations of what the solicitors told their client is, 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 is it's being said, they, they said it would, um, it would settle at stage two. Um, they, they didn't say that, come to what they did say. But the, but Sorry, the point is, is say settle what? at stage two or after. Sorry, they didn't say what? They didn't say that the case would settle at stage two. What did they say? Well, I'm going to come to the contractual documents very shortly, So, but I'm very happy to... to well, what did they say in, in, in 
in a broad term. They, it might settle in stage two. Well, oh, absolutely, yes. But in right. most cases, don't. And, and that takes us into some of the points the law society make. But if you're going to get into the communicating this information, then you do start having to provide for <coughs> a myriad of variables. Right. Now, um, the, the other point also is, is that we say is significant is that Ms. Belsa's position is maintained even though in the result the total deduction of unrecovered costs from her compensation is 20% for both successfully and unrecovered basic charges is less than the 25% deduction which she expressly agreed to in respect of the successfully alone. Do we know how the £321.25 is calculated? Yes, um, um, and, and of course the calculation of the basic charges and the success fee and the ratio between them would alter if we are correcting the appeal. But on the judge's findings, of the £321.25, uh, there was a £75, uh, £75 success fee plus with VAT taking it up to £90. <coughs> and the reason for that is the, the success fee was, was, was 15% after assessment. Um, and after the judge's ruling, um, that was applied to base costs of £500 rather than the base cost which the solicitors had initially charged. Um, and I've, I've, sorry, you've explained how the 75, how 75 pounds plus VAT of that is, is calculated at 15% of 500, but I've not understood how the 32125 was calculated. Um, the 32125 is the difference between the 500 pounds uh, that the solicitors um, recovered by way of basic charges from the other side um, and the um, um, eight hundred and twenty-one pounds fifty pre-VAT that the client's actually the client was actually billed by the solicitors. Do we, do we know how the eight two one fifty or, or the eight two one twenty-five was calculated? Yes, it, it, I appreciate the your lordship may have only have seen this yesterday, but if I don't know if you have the one page, um, the one page. Um, um, I, I don't seem to have it actually. But no, don't worry. Well, um, we can um, certainly yeah, hand in a hard copy if you would. Another copy of your skeleton, and I think the documents attached to it. I'm not you, sure, you, my you, lord, if everybody had that. There was a message email. from your clerk that you wanted some documents that, we, that were brought over. Um, what paragraph two of this summary says, and and indeed the table says, is that the 321.25 plus VAT is 25% of the general damages of 1541.98. Uh, yes, that's right. And again, I, I, so the way, so it's twenty five percent of the general damages plus sundries, um, and it works out as twenty percent of the of the damages overall. Because they didn't apply, um, they they didn't take any deduction from the special damages. Right. So so um, it, looking at this, I'm grateful. So looking at this document for the benefit of my lord, Lord Justice Newby, um you'll see that um, if I just go to the table, yeah. the total damages are 1900 odd, um, of which the sum of, of, of general damages and, and sundries are 154198. Um, 500 pounds was recovered. Um, oh, and then where are you, sorry? What, what are you looking at? Here? We're looking at the one page summary. Which page? Which pa pa paragraph? Oh, it's the table, the table at the foot of it. Yes. I mean, I find this document unbelievably confusing. Right. And, and the way you're describing it, with figures all over the place. I mean, can we start at the beginning if you want to go through figures? Why do we need to go through figures? What, what, what have the figures got to do with this? Well, I, I just, I'm just it's asking... It's principle. Well, I, I don't disagree, yeah. but my but Lord... Could you not just answer my Lord's question, which is how is the £831.25 calculated? Well, I thought that I was answering it, but, 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 well, but there it is. Just, just, um, just explain what the figure is. Right, the the eight hundred and um, twenty one uh, twenty five um, is the five hundred pounds recovered from the personal injury defendant, as we've called it in our skeleton, um, and then the three hundred twenty one pound twenty five difference is twenty five percent of the general damages and sundries, which totaled one five four one ninety eight, which was the voluntary cap which solicitors imposed at the point at which they charge their client. Because, and um, whereas the contractual documents only obligated them to apply a cap to the success fee, 
perhaps atypically, certainly atypically of the way in which business is generally done by personal injury solicitors now, um, they in fact applied the cap to um, not just to the success fee, but to the whole of their charges. Thank you. And your point was that the solicitors had recovered the £500 from the defendant. From the insurers, so they only actually charge the client three hundred and twenty-one twenty-five. That that um, that's that's correct. Of which uh, seventy-five pounds plus VAT was the success fee, which isn't challenged. Yeah. So that's where we get to Mr. Justice Lavender, the result of his judgment being a refund. Two hundred ninety pounds, five pounds fifty. That's what you allow for the success fee, which wasn't ultimately. Two hundred and ninety-five fifty. Yes. Yeah. So the appeal is about two hundred and ninety-five pounds fifty. Uh, yes. Right. Yes, and that's one of the issues uh, uh, which both Mr. Holland and I have touched on in our um, um, our skeletons in terms of this, this. This court wants to look at the bigger picture going forwards. I mean, these cases. Um, in terms of what the clients, the former clients get out of them, even if they succeed, are usually about very small sums of money. What is actually, in our submission, driving them commercially is the amount of costs at which the clients' successor solicitors are getting out of it, which in this case, I think, as assessed by the district judge long before this became a test case, were 12 times the amount in contention. And I think in the SGI case, your lordships have on Friday the ratio between the refund that was claimed for the client but not obtained, and the cost which the check my legal fees claim was a ratio of 48 to 1. Well, will you say that this is a totally inappropriate method of assessing costs in the High Court, and that the legal ombudsman process is the process that should be adopted, and that if it's not adopted, they should be mulched in costs? Uh, that, uh, that so you say, or perhaps they say in SGI legal, uh, that uh, section 7010 should be used, since we haven't got any revised legislation, to uh, make it very clear by a statement of this court that if you bring a claim about a very small sum of money in the High Court and bring it to this sort of level, you will be paying the costs because you could have gone to the legal ombudsman and resolved the claim for nothing. Uh, th that is, is I, I mean, obviously I can't speak for SGI, but that would certainly be our proposition. And I, I would also make the point um, that, that, that obviously in general, um, every other sort of, of, of litigation, even if it be a micro-commercial dispute, that's about a few hundred pounds gets you a third of a small claims track, which is a cost-free which is a cost-free process, and, and we don't see any reason why these cases can't be allocated the small claims track. This judges aren't doing it because of this strange artefact that so there they're all in the small High Court. claims track in the High Court. Well, I, I don't think there's anything in the rules to say that there isn't. Um, well, we could make one, you mean. Well, so, so, um, and, and in any event, it's always been, been well-recognised, and there's authorities of this court on the subject, that if for whatever reason a case doesn't get allocated, um, that's, that, um, that's, um, that doesn't mean um, that the court can't, can't, as a matter of discretion, as it were, shadow the, the, the cost that would have been covered had it been treated as a small case. Is it, is it um, your case, having been very closely associated with this case, that the Solicitors Act provisions are no longer really fit for purpose in relation to the assessment of costs of county court proceedings? It must be said that the Solicitors... I, I think there's an almost universal view that the Solicitors Act is in sore need of updating. Um, obviously, to a considerable extent, we see that from the fact this is all high court, and you have the what some might think is the ridiculous um, um, sight of Mr. Justice Lavender dealing with an appeal over less than three hundred pounds, and then in SGI League an appeal over less than two hundred pounds. Um, um, and, and there are various other. I don't want to get into the arcana of it, but there are various other ways in which I think it would be widely accepted within the profession that the Solicitors Act. Uh, no uh, longer reflects uh, contemporary commercial practice. If I could, without, as I said, wanting to get into our kind of just to give you one example, which has nothing to do with this case. When the Solicitors Act was introduced, it was extremely unusual for solicitors to, to submit interim bills. And now, if you instruct Hogan Novels or whoever it may be in the city, they'll be billing you every month. Um, now, the client's right to detail assessment under Section 70 is subject to strict time limits that run from the date of delivery of each bill. 
And so if a client wants to complain about Hogan Lovells or whoever it may be's bill in the middle of litigation, they've either got a fallout with their solicitor uh, 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 um, and, and, and apply for an assessment whilst they've got better things to do, uh, um, um, or, um, or they, they risk losing their right to assessment because of the time limit. So the, it's not just in this area, I'm afraid there are multiple areas where there is a general perception amongst civil practitioners that the Solicitors Act is at the very least creaking as it seems. Yes, and um, Section 74.3, which is an issue in this case, uh, you would accept whoever wins is an example of that being an illogical distinction in the modern era. Um, between between non <coughs> non contentious and contentious costs. Well, I mean certainly. Um, I mean, so, I mean what, what is certainly the case is that um, the rules are predicated. We say, if we're right, the legislation is predicated on a on a stark division between contentious and uncontentious business, um, which um, uh, um, um, is not a division which really one observes in practice. Because, and I think we touched on this last time, one has the the, the two employment lawyers. For musing spectacle that their uh, work in the tribunals is treated as non-contentious, so that there is certainly a chasm between the statutory language, which leads to um, results which seem linguistically curious. But, but, but as, as I think we say in our skeleton, it's not the whole because the way these are just labels, and if the labels the legislature had chosen instead of contentious and non-contentious business was court and non-court business, you know, all the curiosity would go away. So, so whether it wouldn't, would it? Because um, you still have a problem with the tribunal. Yes. Yeah. And you still have a problem of, uh, which in a sense is this case, that you've got protocols which are designed to, to lead to fewer cases getting to court. But if they, do, if they don't settle in, in, at the pre-action stage, they do go to court. And this sort of bizarre spectacle of the, effectively the same, that proportion of the cost, which is before the proceeding, is being dealt with in a different way depending on whether there are any proceedings. Well, I, mean, I certainly accept that the way in which the, poly, the, the scheme that's been alighted upon, uh, um, it was probably, it was, it was curious even at the time, probably, because it, it's obviously not true to say, right back in 1974, one used to just receive writs out of the blue. I mean, one sometimes did, but, but not invariably. It was curious even at the time. In modern conditions with protocols, it, become, it looks even more curious. But whether or not the particular aspects your lordships have just put into me give rise to real world problems uh, rather than semantic curiosities. My respectful submission is not so clear. I mean, n nobody appears to be suggesting there is some sort of a problem because employment tribunal proceedings are strictly speaking non-contentious. Um, and in fact, the the, the 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 general view, and it's the view that we'll we'll see when we get into it, is is that in the real world there is no difference between the way in which yes, costs are contested for contentious and really, non-contentious business. I mean, one of your points is that ultimately the way in which costs are assessed is broadly the same. Well, you, oh my lord, we have a. But not the same, because well, fair and reasonable does not equal reasonable. Well, we would. Well, and isn't section 74.3? One has a worked example of that, we would say, in the two cases before your lordship this week, because, of course, one of the quirks of this case is that the district judge who, um, in this case, found the costs were contentious, in SGI, having heard argument from Mr. Marvin QC, decided he had been wrong and decided the costs were non contentious. That may, but if you actually look at the, the way in which the district judge then went on to assess the costs, which no one at court of appeal level in either appeal criticises in either case, no, you, it's simply impossible to see any difference in the way the district judge goes about assessing the costs but he would find that, contentious <coughs> in this case and non-contentious I mean, in the other. That may be true, uh, but it is not a reason why the principles applicable should be different. Well, I, 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 but, but, I mean, the reality is the principles. I mean, if one sets aside transactional work, where it is well established that in non-contentious cases a, a solicitor may, may, may proceed by value rather than by the amount of work that's done. But if, if one looks at how costs are assessed for cases which settle without the need for proceedings, um, and one of the fallacies in my learned friend's um, um, uh, skeleton is to say that before the CPR, you didn't get costs if you settled. And that, that was obviously wrong. Of course, people settled without proceedings uh, on terms that costs were payable um, before the civil procedure rules. Um, um, there has never been a distinction um, in the real world between the ways on, in, in which those were cons assessed, or taxed as it was, depending on whether or not proceedings had actually been issued. Because my learned friends in their skeleton identify two differences. Um, they um, say that um, one difference is, um, um, is that in non-contentious work you take into account value, 
that's not a difference at all, because if you look at the rules for contentious costs, you take into account value for contentious costs as well. The other is the point that your lordship, my lord, the master of the rules, has just put to me, um, which is uh, reasonable versus fair and reasonable. Um, and obviously, one, one understands that um, conceptually, um, those are slightly different things. But in the real world, um, judges find that unreasonable costs are unfair, um, and unfair costs are unreasonable. It might, it might be a philosophical difference. Well, um, can, I just, can I just put to you something else? I mean, I, I understand this debate, and um, you, you can take it as far as you want, but I think we have these points very firmly in mind. Um, the thing that seems most unreasonable at first sight is that the practice that seems widespread um, from the evidence we have seen um, of solicitors, I put it this way, signing their clients up to pay uh, what are very substantial fees as compared to the fixed recoverable costs, and then saying at the end, without having told them they would at the end say this, um, well, you've only recovered two and a half thousand pounds, and so out of the goodness of our hearts, we'll just charge you the success fee, which you always accepted you'd have to pay, which, prima facie, you say is a reasonable thing to do, and they should be commended for it. But what seems, at first sight, unreasonable is that the client doesn't know that. And so if they don't know that, then it seems to be all in the gift of the solicitor at, uh, after the event, which is a bad thing. Yes. Now, what's your, what do you say about that? Well, I mean, the first thing to point to, uh, the first, my first response is to say, um, I don't attempt to say it is a good thing. Uh, um, that isn't part of my case. I entirely understand the concern which your lordship has expressed. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, what I, um, what I would divorce it from, however, is, 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 is look, and there's an entire, and particularly, Obviously, this court, uh, um, solicitors are officers of the court, uh, um, and uh, uh, this court um, will always have in mind um, the reasonableness of their business practices. And uh, as the master of the rules, you also have specific, specific, specific responsibilities with respect to the solicitor's profession, and we, we, we recognise all of that, and, and, and nothing um, that I say is intended to attempt to seduce your lordship away from saying anything which your lordship wants to say about future practice. But there is a distinction from the point that I am here brief to, to address your lordships from as to whether it should lead to a remedy in these proceedings where we say the claimant has not in fact suffered any mischief whatsoever and, 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 and mustn't lose sight of that point. So, so you're, you're standing on the sidelines of that debate. Well, I, I, I'm and not... Would you, just another thing, it occurred to me that Section 56 of the Solicitors Act may be relevant to this. You'll know that in 2009... An order was made under Section 56 of the Solicitors Act, which is relevant in SGI. The, uh, section 56 is the section that allows the Lord Chief Justice, Master of the Rolls, and Lord Chancellor to make an order about non-contentious costs. And, and indeed, they, they not, not obviously me in those days, did in 2009. They haven't done many such orders. But I, I thought somebody was going to submit that that would be a possibility to remedy um, the iniquity I've spoken about if it is indeed an iniquity. Well, um, can I, um, I, I'd want to, uh, I, I don't immediately think, can, can't immediately think of any objection to what your Lordship has posited about um, some form of, 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 of um, uh, revised, um, I suppose, it's subordinate legislation to, to make the responsibility of solicitors clear. Of course, what I, I also do um, want to say is also reply to the point your lordship put to me just now, um, where I would again respectfully part company from your lordship, is that I don't accept that this is a matter of, of, of pure goodwill that is in the heart of solicitors um, who, have not, um, who have not imposed a, a, a global cap on their ability to charge. Um, I mean, I'm not suggesting that it wouldn't be better, certainly in terms of transparency, if at the outset, and as I think the evidence, such as it is, shows has, has become increasingly the practice. And in fact, even between this case and SGI, where I think Mr Justice Lambert found there wasn't a contractual, a cap that was actually contractually effective. But the solicitors had, had in that case at least given their clients assurances that they, they would aspire not to charge more than 25% of the compensation. So one sees the sort of commercial development even in the two cases in front of you and, it, and, it's, and it's come on since then. 
um, as the evidence shows. But, but you know, e even though in terms of a future business practice, um, I suspect it will simply would not be controversial at all that it would be superior for there to be what in the jargon of these cases has, has become known as an overall cap. Um, rather, than the, rather than the statutory cap, which under the legislation is attributable to the success fee alone. Um, it mustn't be thought that absent that, um, one is simply left to the, the good-heartedness of solicitors, because clearly they have the regulatory responsibilities, which Mr Holland and Mr Cohen address at considerable length in their skeleton. And these solicitors also have contractual obligations um, in their CFAs themselves to give their clients the best possible advice about costs. And it's not a term it's... I, I, um, that the CFA uses, but it, it's a reasonable paraphrase, and to conduct a cost-benefit analysis. And so in, 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 in the various nightmare scenarios, if you'll forgive the slightly crude uh, terminology that the judge posits of people going to court and either seeing almost all or all of their damages wiped out, or even having a net liability to their damages, after, uh, to their solicitors after the whole of the damages were consumed, it's not as if there aren't pretty obvious remedies for that. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> And in fact, ironically, because of the because of the, the, the additional criterion of fairness, if there is any distinction between contentious and uncontentious business, um, it might possibly be that you're best protected from uncontentious business, because it might be said, well, however reasonable it is, it is not fair for you to charge uh, um, more than your client has recovered, uh, when this was uh, uh, something you should have warned them about at the very beginning. So I, I do... I, 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 I accept, so to just to condense it, I accept your lordship's proposition it would be better um, um, if there had been an overall cap from the start. I say, however, that whilst that might well affect what, you're, what, what uh, this court has to say about uh, in terms of guidance, it should not affect the outcome of the appeals because whatever the position may have been, this client has done uh, has suffered no detriment which merits a judicial remedy. Um, and, 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 and thirdly, notwithstanding, obviously I accept that the position would have been improved if there had been a cap from the start, it is not as if that Ms. Belson was, 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 was left at large on a sort of laissez-faire uh, world where she had no other protections than her solicitor's munificence. If, 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 if my instructing solicitors had tried to do what, what the judge um, said they theoretically could have done, uh, I mean, quite apart from conventional issues of professional negligence because of the, the gross breach of their duties under the, the Code of Conduct, which Mr. Holland sets out in the skeleton, there would be obvious remedies from both uh, the Ombudsman and from the judge on detailed assessment, because it simply could not be reasonable or fair, depending which of the two tests one applied, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, um, uh, um, deduct the pure time cost of doing the work if the client had not been warned that they would and had exceeded the compensation. Um, Are we getting a transcript of this... Um I noticed that last time you took a transcript, but we didn't get it. Oh, well, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. Um, um, if uh, it were possible to get... If you're having a transcript made, are you? I, I would have to ask others. There's obviously no live note, but um, I'm sure that... No, uh, well, live note is not a requirement, but um, if there is a transcript made, um, we would like to get it electronically when it's ready. Certainly. Yes, uh, that, 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 that will be arranged. Um, so, um, I, uh, so as far as the retainer documents are concerned, uh, clearly um, your indi lordship's um, indicated to me that a great deal of pre-reading has been done, So, um, um, and I appreciate that I went through some of them um, with those members of the bench who were here in February before. Um, I did, however, just propose to isolate what we say are the terms that do allow um, um, okay. both the cost to be deducted and also the terms that I've really just been averting to, which give the client contractual rights, quite apart from her regulatory rights, um, if some of the worst case scenarios which have been possible is actually eventuated. Um, now, so far as the, so far as the timeline um, is concerned, the accident was on the 5th of February 2016. Um, so this has appeared to have been contacted by Ms. Belson's insurance brokers, and she speaks to them on the 7th of March. Um, and she sent some voluminous but sadly typical client care documents that day, which consist of a covering letter, a, a, a client care agreement, a CFA, and the standard terms of business. Um, uh, now, um, so far as the client care letter is concerned, um, are all members of the bench using electric, electronic 
papers. Or... Oh, I've got paper bundles as well. Right. Well, I'm, I'm entirely in your hands as to whether I give sort of. Um, um, but we need we need uh, electronic references. But I know. Yes. Well, um, so far as the kind of letter is concerned, it's 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 PDF one, page three hundred and sixty-four. What do you call PDF one? Oh, so the, the PDFs I have are, n are actually numbered in their titles. Um, Not mine. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, um, I have core bundle, supplemental bundle. That's core bundle. Authorities bundle and material and bundle. And statutory material. Statutory material. Yes. Very good. I'll try to use that terminology. It, it, that would be the core bundle, my lord, page three six four. Um, and for those using three um, six four. Three six four. Mm -hmm. And it's 365, I'm so sorry, because it's the usual, well, it's the issue of the PDF being behind by one. Yeah, OK. Um, so for my, um, for anybody using the, the, the documents, it's, it's, it's um, tab 31, page 364, 365 in the PDF. Right. <coughs> Good. 7th of March, 2016. Yes. I think I, I might actually dive into the um, hard copy myself. And she was put in touch with the um, solicitors through um, her insurance broker. Her insurance broker, yes. But she had an insurance broker, yet she was a pillion passenger. So I don't, didn't quite get that bit. I don't know the answer to that. Of course, whether or not she was the owner of the motorcycle and therefore she was the insured, even though she was the passenger. Um, I don't know the answer to, or whether or not it was a sort of um, you know, undifferentiated family sort of approach. I, I simply can't answer. Okay. Um, we can, if it's thought to be. The, that the, the defendant to the claim was a driver of a car, not the driver. Not of the driver the of the. Not 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 the not the driver. And of the we motorcycle. don't know who the driver of the motorcycle was. No. No. I, I, I well, think if you look at page three eleven. I was going to say. I suspect we could find out. There's a, there's a reference to a Mr. Dominic Pagel. Is he the driver? Ah, in fact, I'm told that um, Ms. Bells, that, that Ms. Bellsner's partner was the insured. I assume therefore the driver. Um, and um, yes, Ms. 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 Bellsner's partner was the insured and the driver of the motorbike. Um, and it was he who gave his her details to the insurance broker. Um, right. So is, is that his name, Mr. Pudgel? Yes, it is, my lord. Thank you. Sorry, I haven't quite got that. What is? Where does he appear? He appears. There's a document. I've um, got him, Pudgel. Yes, I've got him. Yes, it uh, the, identifies the injured parties. Mr. So Dominic Pudgel. Got him. Yes. He so was he, injured too, was he? He was injured too. Yes. Right. Well, I don't know. If he's also got a... together. Were the claims conducted together? I'm just waiting for instructions on that. Okay, we're at three seven right. one um, now. The, the answer to time, right? Well, the answer to that is 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 um, there were there were both claims. His, in fact, was, was conducted slightly ahead of hers. Um, yes. So, so, so was, the, the same solicitors, instructed by the same brokers, acted for both Miss Belsner and her partner, who were both injured in exactly the same instance. They did it separately. Well, of course, all of this set without proceedings. If proceedings had been issued, then no doubt um, they probably would have been put onto the same claim form. But, but this is all settled under the free action protocol. In, I assume in I assume in both cases. Yes, I, in in both cases. So uh, a claim was notified for the for the driver, and then slightly in arrears, a claim was notified for Miss Belsner. You can actually see in the papers. I didn't want to get into it as a as irrelevant. There is a there is a hiatus because. Ms. Belsner is initially contacted, she doesn't respond, the file is closed, and then it's reopened again when contact is made with her a few weeks later. So whether or not that, that explains the, the delay, I, I, I don't know, but it may well do. Thank you. Um, so the, 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 the client care letter is at, um, as I was saying, it's at page 364 or 365 electronically. Um, as it deals with the calculation of charges um, from paragraph two, um, and then the conditional fee agreement and the success fee are referred to um, from um, paragraph um, seven. Um, at, at paragraph that, that's on page three six six electronically. 
Our charges are based on the time we spend dealing with the case, it said at paragraph 7. Um, there's an exhortation to read the CFA carefully. Um, if you win, you're liable to pay our basic charges and a success fee. And then there's a, winning about the possible, a warning about the possible consequences of it being a small claim. Um, if your claim is above the small claims limit, limit, you can claim from your opponent part or all of our basic charges and disbursements. Um, and then there is um, a, an explanation about the success fee uh, uh, and how that can't exceed 25% of the damages at, at 12 and 13. And that's rec that cap reflects the statutory cap on success fees in personal injury cases. Um, it's over the page at paragraph 18 that um, it's explained that in cases involving accidents worth less, road accidents involving less than 25,000, the amount the defendant is liable to pay in respect to our basic charges is fixed by the provisions of the CPR. We reserve the right to charge you the actual cost, taking into account any recoverable cost from the defendant. We also reserve the right to charge any cost incurred prior to the date of the CFA. So why doesn't it say how much those fixed costs are? Well, I think the 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 answer to to, to that is is the number of well, I don't think there's any evidence as to what the answer to that is. But one of the points that's made both by us and the Law Society is when you start seeing the number of variables there are. Once you realise that in fact it's a fallacy to say that most cost cases of this no, but fixed costs are fixed costs. I mean, they're two hundred pounds stage one. Three hundred pounds is it stage two? But, but once they fall out of the protocol, then you are subject yeah. to the, the different fixed cost regime in in in, in section three A of Part forty five, which is much more complicated. And for example, um, um, it has um, that also deals with pre issue costs. Uh, then it deals with the cost of issuing. Then it's cost of the date of allocation, and then cost of the, um, the, the then then cost of the date it's set down for trial, and then the cost of going to trial. Um, obviously, all of these are concepts which a layperson, like what does a layperson make of the term allocation? What does it mean to say your cost to the point of allocation? It's a big watershed. I mean, in a case where liability is expected to be admitted, cases do often settle, irrespective of the numbers. They often settle at stage two, because that's the whole purpose of the protocol and the portal, which has been very successful. Yes. And even more so with the whiplash portal, right? Uh, I, I can't speak to, to, to in, in really with any knowledge of, of the whiplash. I mean, these are small but... claims where insurers, provided liability is established or accepted, which it often is, will pay what are relatively small sums. Yes. So, I mean, I think you've said you're not saying it wouldn't be a good idea. You're just saying that's not part of what we have to decide. Well, what I think I've said wouldn't be a good idea, wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, is for solicitors to, um, as, as the profession has, has substantially done, um, to enlarge the statutory cap um, um, from, from success the only to an overall cap. So the client said at the advance, there will be unrecovered costs, but don't worry, you can never be net out of pocket because it's limited to 25% or 30% or whatever it may be of your compensation. So you pay nothing if you lose, and if you win, um, your costs will be covered by your compensation and you'll be left with at least 75% of that um, un unquestionably, that would be better than what um, this and other solicitors were doing at this earlier stage. Yes, and, and, and Mr. Holland is reminding me that that, for example, is what happened in, in, in another fixed cost case, which has come to this court called Herbert and H.H. H. Law, mm. which gets cited. So, what, 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 I, what, what both Mr. Holland and I say, uh, um, in fact, um, wouldn't um, be helpful in any way. Because one already sees that the amount of, 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 um, of documentation which clients uh, um, get uh, um, because of the due diligence that's required under the Code of Conduct and in respect of CFAs is all, all already very substantial. Is to have any sort of detailed briefing on the fixed cost regime, which we um, suggest would frankly be double dutch to, to, um, um, to, 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 to most of them. Um, and obviously isn't necessary if the client has the sort of assurance that I've posited for future cases, namely, you don't need to worry because it will be covered by compensation of which you will keep it. I mean, there's another percent. illogicality in the rules, isn't there, which is what I was alluding to when we sat in February, but before I'd had a chance to think so deeply about this case and, and the general picture. The, it's illogical that the CPR provides for fixed costs in the portal and provides for provisions relating to the acceptance of offers under Part 36 in the portal, 
um, and also CPR uh, PD 8B, I think, yes. provides for protocol. Protocol. Yeah, so, yeah. protocol, but does not uh, provide anything else, and the CPR actually doesn't otherwise deal with pre action um, protocol. And so the logic of all this is that Section 24 of the new Judicial Review and Courts Act passed since we last met um, should be used to make uh, rules for the pre-action portal spaces um, and the CPR should be left to make rules for litigation and that would then um, give some logic at least to the non-contentious contentious distinction yes and and um, it occurs to me that that having these sort of dipping your toe in the CPR for the portal is rather unsatisfactory but now we're going to have an OPRC an online procedure rules committee the online procedure rules committee can make rules for the portal which is what it's there for and the statute now provides it should and um, the CPR can stick to litigation and that would at least be logical well, I don't dis with respect, I don't disagree with any of that. You know, clearly what we have is a, a sort of accumulation of patches um, that is, from which a system has emerged that might not have looked like how it would look if it was drafted from scratch. Um, no. um, and we've had, obviously, a continual process of reform um, since the CPR in 1999. I can't remember how many updates we've had. Is it 250 or something? I think it's 101. Oh, it's not quite as bad as I thought, but there have been a lot. And then, obviously, in foot with that, we've had the sort of constant cost reform um, since, 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 since 2013, as your Lordship has said, continuing really even during the life of this case. And, 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 and uh, so, so I, I entirely accept that it would, um, the cis there is ample scope for rationalisation. Yes, and the, the reality is, of course, we can't, we can't deal with that here, uh, but the part of that picture is the pre-action protocol picture, which has always been in the gift, or so it appears, of the Master of the Rolls, saying let's have a pre-action protocol for building claims, let's have a pre-action protocol for admin claims, let's have one for this or for that. <coughs> there are now 16 of them. Yes. Uh, the Civil Justice Council is looking at all that, but again, if there is to be, I mean, if, if the legislature decided, and it seems to have decided that in section 22 to 24 of the new legislation, that the, the watershed is when you go into the, you, you start proceedings, then, okay, that fits in with contentious, non-contentious, if you're right, in your Section 74 argument, uh, but it requires quite a lot more work um, so that limitations on what you can recover is made clear to the client. I mean, the, all the problem in this, I'm sorry to go on about it, but all the problem in this is caused by... Uh, Lord Justice Jackson's statement that we can't regulate the relationship between the solicitor and the client. We can only regulate mm. the relationship party and party, and that will have an effect on the relationship with solicitor and client. But of course, not only can we, but we do regulate solicitor-client relationship. Indeed, as Mr. Holland uh, educates us, the code is extremely prescriptive in that space. And so, um, really, we've got to look at the thing holistically and make sure that the party and party side is not inconsistent with the solicitor and client side. I mean, that ought to be what uh, a rational system does. Yes, ultimately, whether or not one also fixes um, or, or, or in some way um, controls costs between solicitor and client on, on other than a time spent basis subject to detailed assessment ex post facto it is obviously ultimately a, 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 a policy decision which is above my pay grade what, what, and, and clearly if I'm right about section 74.3 um, then subject to the, the ex post facto right of detailed assessment there is much less regulation of, of costs between solicitor and client but there is still as Mr Holden shows there's still plenty because quite outside the court system one has the ombudsman and one has the regulator uh, um, um, but, um, but clearly there's been much less activity um, in, in, in respect of solicitor client costs and inter-parties costs. I think when we last assembled, your Lordship was very concerned that somehow the, 
the, the, um, the, 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 the different approaches between solicitor and client might undermine what had been done into parties. Um, um, and in our respect, it, it, it doesn't undermine what's been done in, in, in interparties, and no one suggests that. Mr. I'm sure it would have delighted Mr. Kirby to be able to say, well, if Williams is right, the whole edifice of fixed costs comes crashing down, so he can't be right. doesn't say that. No, no, no one says that. But uh, un un unquestionably, um, the, um, having a holistic system uh, um, in policy terms might be more satisfactory. Yes, and you know, I think somebody said, maybe you, maybe Mr. Holland, that solicitors couldn't operate if Mr. Kirby was right. But you've already submitted, and, and I hadn't seen it in your skeleton, that it would be a sensible arrangement for solicitors to, I think, self-impose an overall cap on damages of 25%. I think you said 25%, did you? And that was the example I gave because it's what the solicitors yeah. in this case did. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously acute. I, mean, I think it is Mr. Holland um, who, 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 who um, makes um, some submissions in his skeleton as to how the um, system, as Check My Legal Fees would have it, where you just get basic charges and a small success fee, would, would not be economic for solicitors. It's Mr. Holland that says they have to be able to deduct um, something to recover basic charges as well. So that's his argument. Not the £75 success fee, which is, I think, the one that Mr. Lev Justice Lavender imposed is not a field. I think it's just better me imposed that, and no one, no one challenged that on either side. I mean, that's a very small success. Well, the the the, the, the issue is is that um, that goes back to the previous decision of this court in Herbert and H H Law, which obviously this case predates. Yes. So it's not a case that would have been entered with the guidance in H H Law, um, and what was decided in Herbert was unless a solicitor makes it clear to the client that the success fee is not a pure charge for risk but is in fact just a sort of general top-up charge in order for the solicitor to break even, then the solicitor can only recover a ch pure charge for risk or, 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 uh, uh, um, and possibly postponement as well, because of course... And there wasn't no much risk in the case of this guy. She's a pillion passenger, so yeah. she's going to get compensated no by someone. Yeah, yeah. So really the only... The only why, just, why are they charging a success fee at all? Be, because they can charge a success fee, um, firstly for... There's always a risk in these cases, for example, the client is, is not telling the truth, and, we all know that, that that is an issue in road traffic claims. There is a, certainly a certain amount of cases that fell because of that. But also the business cost of delay in payment. And the, these, the, the, remember, the solicitor is, isn't just only deferring their payment, they're also funding all the disbursements. So the solicitors may be paying out sort of hundreds of pounds to um, a, a medical expert and so on. I think this case, case took nearly 14 months to conclude, and that, that obviously has a, a business expense as compared to going to a solicitor who at your first meeting says, right, I'd like £5,000 on account or whatever it may be. So, so, so that, that, that is, I, mean, I, I, I don't have the knowledge to say that conventional success fees have developed um, in these cases in the first instance. Um, but certainly um, in the days when success fees were recovered between the parties, there were six fixed success fees um, and 12.5% was the fixed success fee for a road traffic case which, which settled uh, um, without, the need for, um, without the need for trial in fact. Um, so 15% is probably a reflection of, 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 of those sort of old rules where that was, that was felt to be reasonable. Thank you. Uh, well, Mr. Holland is telling me that Herbert is, is wrong, but I will leave, um, <laughs> I, 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 I leave him to develop that. Uh, Sorry, um, Mr. Holland is saying that we should say Herbert is wrong. No, I'm not. No, I think he was being... I'm not saying you should say. We, but, I, I think he was uh, incisive. We have real problems with Herbert, but we didn't intervene, so it served us right. I think Mr. I think Mr. Holland was inciting me to have to have another fallout with the bench, which is certainly not my intention. I mean, I actually think um, that we that that Herbert doesn't actually affect what we have to decide in this case. No, uh, well, that's certainly our case. Um, we and obviously what Herbert does, well, I'll, I'll uh, Herbert introduces concepts of informed consent, um, but in respect to a different rule. It, well, it, I mean, it does not say the part forty six point nine. Uh, three has to be read across to two. It doesn't. Uh, but Mr. Kirby does. Indeed. And, and we'll hear his argument in due course yes. at that point. But he, I mean, he says uh, certain parts of Herbert, things that were accepted in Herbert may have been. Yes. Um, I think you're, I, obviously, I, I, I was going through the document, but your lordship put some points. Yes, keep going. To I'm, me. I'm yes. on paragraph 19. I'm obliged. So, um, 
if one um, if if, if one gets to the bottom of uh, uh, paragraph 23, um, most cattle, most, that, that's where we have the cost estimate. Most PI claims settled by negotiation after medical evidence and details of financial losses have been obtained. And, and that's where we get the £2,500 cost estimate, which excludes VAT and disbursements. Um, uh, and, and they promise to update you if the estimate succeeded and it warns it might change significantly. Um, and then it, it says, relatively accurately in this case, a typical PI case takes on average about 15 um, months to uh, conclude. Um, then over the page, it's explained that they don't send well, a in bill. in the previous, sorry to get back. No, not so. In 23, they say this could change significantly for a number of reasons. For example, if proceedings have to be issued. Yes. Which does indicate that they expect them not to have to be issued in many cases. That, that is a fair point. So when it says most settled by negotiation after medical evidence and details of financial losses have been obtained, the message the client takes from that is most cases settle at that point, in other words, in the portal at stage two, without proceedings having to be issued. Well, I'm not, not, not sure I go quite so far as to say within the portal, because lots of cases fall out of the portal because, right. for example, there are strict time limits. And you know, motor insurers, um, you know, they, 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 we've all dealt with motor insurers. Um, some are more efficient than others. You know, there are lots of cases fall out of the portal more or less by accident because of time limit goes. So, in not, but, but it's certainly true to say, obviously, with respect, most personal injury cases, certainly involving road traffic passengers, don't get issued because there's no yes. conceivable point on liability unless frauds are alleged. Yes. Mm. I mean, that's the point at which they say this is going to cost you two and a half thousand pounds. They also say elsewhere you can recover part or all, all of our basic costs from the. That was that was at um, twenty six. Yes, and, and also at 10. If your claim is above the small claims limit, which they've explained is £1,000, you can claim from your opponent part or all of our basic charges and disbursements. What they don't say is that if it settles when most of them do, and it's in the portal, of the 2,500, you can't recover part or all of it. You can recover a small 20% of it. That's what they don't well, say. Well, why not? Obviously, that is there in black and white. And, and, and if, if it had been said, then we wouldn't be here. Yes. Um, my, the only answer, the answer I have to it, and I submit it as a robust answer, because civil proceedings, this is a money claim, in essence. It's a, it's a, claim, it's a claim for a remedy, because the client says she's been hard done by. Now, is it, if as a result of this lacuna, which your lordship has just, with respect, rightly identified, she had been hard done by, the complexion of this case would be completely different. But what, she, what the client she wasn't hard done by. The, the client is not a lawyer. The client's going to have difficulty reading this whole letter and understanding it. What they want to know is, am I going to win? How much will I recover? And how much will it cost me if I win? And how much will it cost me if I lose? If yes. you, you can't see that clearly from this letter. Can you? Well, you, you, you can't see it clearly from this letter, no. And, and as I say, business practice are evolving. I, 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 I will, I will um, plead guilty at the last <coughs> hearing where your lordship was, was you know, mercifully spared. Uh, um, a, a half a day of, of my submissions that I, I did embark on something of a creed occur for the personal injury um, side of the solicitor's profession to say that they've been labouring under constant reform since Jackson which has completely changed the way in which they have to do business yeah. no, um, no. and we recognise I, I certainly recognise on behalf of my client that, 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 that things have been that they've gone about this case in a way in which with the benefit of hindsight they they could have gone and get about it in a better way, and very probably there's no evidence of this. But very probably they do now go about it in a, in a, in a, in a better way, because as, as I've said, it doesn't seem to be controversial. Um, um, uh, systems where solicitors cap their total deductions from damages rather than just successfully deductions are now ubiquitous. Um, I can't say they're always 25%. I think there are some solicitors that, that will say a higher figure than that. Uh, um, it's always less, and it's, it's, it's always um, sort of. I'm not sure I've ever seen a case higher than about 35% or something. But I, I think I have seen, not this solicitor, but I have seen overall deductions which are higher. But in, in this case, as we've seen, the solicitor voluntarily imposed a 25% a reduction if one, or 20% if you look at her special damages as well. And that um, is a completely routine way of going about matters. And what's unsatisfactory, and I accept theoretically could have caused problems, is it was done at the end of the case, not at the beginning. But obviously, my, my case in terms of this being a, a money claim from Miss Belton for a remedy is it was done at the end of the case. And as a result of that, she has suffered no detriment whatsoever. She didn't complain at the time. She didn't invoke any of the remedies she had. And it's just when she's fallen into the hands of check my legal fees a year later 
um, uh, that they suddenly say, oh, she needs a refund of a couple of hundred pounds uh, to give us an opportunity of, 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 of claiming costs, which the district judge assessed at £3,800, 12 times more than Ms. Belsmer got out of this case. And in SGI legal, it's 48 times more than uh, Ms. Karatich got out of the case. I mean, that, that, that is the, there is a certain amount of humbug, uh, I, I'm afraid, on the side of, of the claimants represent, I don't mean my learned friends, but on, in, on, on, on the side of, of those who represent uh, um, claimants in these cases, you know, it's, it, 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 the, 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 their refunds are a very small dog with an extremely disproportionate tail, and I mean disproportionate in both the technical and physical senses of that word. <coughs> um, so um, yes, I, I, I quite as having going through these documents, um, that um, of course the position could have been clearer, but the, cla the claimant hasn't, in my submission, uh, suffered um, um, any detriment. And uh, the CFA, really the, the same points can be made. The CFA in our submission does make it clear um, that um, there, are, um, there are, um, um, is a risk, um, a real risk of deductions from damages, which are insufficient uh, 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 because <coughs> inter-parties costs uh, um, will not be a complete indemnity, and not just in respect of the success fee. But it doesn't give the clients the information that would enable the, um, the, the scale of the theoretical risk to be identified, because we say it's not a real world risk, because the solicitors would never have dreamed of doing uh, other than what they did do, which is to make a, a, a relatively modest deduction in accordance with industry norms. And in, indeed, they, they deducted less from the damages um, by way of the totality of their costs than the Parliament uh, uh, um, has permitted them to deduct just for the success fee. So they simply have not behaved in a way which is in any way unreasonable or unfair. Well, your point in answer to my Lord the Master of the Rolls earlier, when he put to you that this was all, as it were, the, um, out of the goodness of their hearts, they don't charge the, the full 2,500 that's mentioned in the client care letter, is that the, 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 there are controlling mechanisms to deal with that um, by way of uh, regulation by the Royal Society by way of the legal ombudsman. My Lord, that's so right. In other words, if your client, if your client had turned round and, and sought to charge Ms. Pelsner two thousand five hundred pounds, and she'd made a claim before the legal ombudsman, um, they'd have found themselves in quite a lot of difficulty. Uh, and indeed, in front of the district judge, um, because yeah. because um, both Mr. Holland and I, the, the detailed assessment, it is a much it is much blacker letter in legal terms. Um, than uh, going to the mm. ombudsman. I mean, going to the ombudsman is, is, isn't palm tree justice, but the strict, strict legal principles don't apply. <coughs> but even in front of, e even on detailed assessment, it is, it's not just a, a simple matter of, 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 of adding up the sums and just looking, oh, sure. looking austerely at what does the contract legislate for. The ultimate criterion on detailed assessment at all, even for contentious business, is what's reasonable. And I think both Mr. Um, Holland and I cite a very influential um, dictum of Mr. Justice Morgan. Um, where he, he says that there will be cases, and, and the case, it's a case called Master Cigars, where a solicitor had greatly exceeded the cost estimate without warning his client, um, without warning their client. Um, and as, as, as Mr. Justice Morgan says, and this is a, a statement that's since been applied day, out, day in, day out in assessments, I'm told, um, is that you know, it's something maybe the, the work done may be reasonable, the hours spent may be reasonable. Um, um, the rates may be reasonable, but the ultimate total is just not reasonable for the total to pay in the events which have happened. That's my paraphrase, but that's the, the sort of... And, and that, with respect, is an absolute truism as, of how detailed assessment works. It's about what's reasonable. Um, and for a solicitor to charge their client um, uh, many multiples um, of, their, of their compensation, particularly if they do so completely without warning, it simply could never... Well, that, be that seems to me to be the real point. If you say to the client... The damages you might get are £10,000, but we're proposing to spend £25,000 on recovering it for you, and the client agrees to it, well, that's one thing. But if you say to the client, we're proposing to charge you £2,500, and you can recover part all of that from the other side, and anything you don't recover, you have to pay us. And the client has no idea what that means in the real world, but it could, in theory, mean, on the face of a document, she receives nothing at all. Well, that seems much less reasonable. Well, I, as I, I, I'm not sure I can say more right. than what I have said to your Lordship already. Um, um, I, I, yes, um, things could have been done better and differently in a rapidly um, evolving world. They unquestionably, or almost unquestionably, now would be. 
Um, but um, as so often in this case, uh, when I say I'm thrown back, I don't mean it defensively, because I, I say the, my, my, my point of refuge is a highly secure refuge. Miss Belsner suffered no detriment. She has not been asked to pay costs which are unreasonable. Um, on the findings of the district judge, on a time spent basis, the solicitors sh um, should have charged her over 40% more. Can I come back on something you said, which I've written down, um, which I didn't understand from your skeleton argument, and that is that the solicitors wouldn't have dreamed of doing anything other than making a proportionate deduction from the damages um, when it came to the end of the case and everything was known. Now, um, whilst I mean, if that is the case, then my Lord's point is even more stark, mm. because um, if they know when they start the case that they're not going to dream of charging more than a particular um, reasonable amount, and that if they're going to get into an argument with checkmylegalfees.com, that is going to be about a very small amount, whether it's you know between uh, limited percentages by way of success fees. Um, then uh, really something needs to be done to make sure that that dream is made clear to clients. Well, as I, I, I think, that, I don't mean this disrespectfully, in a way that's a point that your Lordship's already put to me under a different guise, and I, I, I you know, of course, I mean, and if it had, been, well, I wouldn't like to say if it had been, we wouldn't be here, because I do understand no. that check my legal fees do challenge solicitors who would impose an overall cap as well. Um, but um, on any view, the shape of the argument would be different. Yes, but the, the I mean, I, I get that, but, um, and I also get that, that you're now acknowledging quite clearly that this um, is, is the right way for solicitors to do business. But what I didn't know is that it was the universal practice mm. at the time for them to impose this arrangement, this kind of arrangement at the end of cases, even if they'd put in an arrangement like this, whereby they could charge significantly more than the damages. And if that's the case, there's no evidence. Of no, well, I, let me, I mean, I, I, it's possible that in a, a rush of um, 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 advocates' enthusiasm, I, I, I overspoke. But I mean, it is certainly, it is, I mean, the first, when I said I, I, they would never dream, I, I, I particularly had in mind the context of the various um, um, uh, um, extra, contra extra contractual sanctions. Um, there would be if somebody did attempt to say to their client. Well, they can go. I mean, they're yeah. likely to have it reduced on reasonableness. But when you say never dreamed, that implies that they knew at the beginning that they would not, under any circumstances, be charging. But in your skeleton, you draw attention to Miss Belsner's unreasonableness. I know you'd call it something else. Um, in asking for work to be done that didn't really need to be done in pursuing a very small case. Now, is it the case that they put in these um, what look like um, unfortunate arrangements at the start in order to protect themselves against unreasonable clients, because we know there are such things, or is it the case uh, that really, even if the client is unreasonable, they're still never going to charge more than um, a proportionate part of the damages? Well, I. I, I what I can certainly say is, is I have seen, uh, I have certainly seen conditional fee agreements, which do, for example, say there will be a deduction limited to X percent. Uh, um, um, but it does give the solicitor an out, uh, um, if you'll forgive the slightly crude language, um, in the event of, of unreasonable instructions, so long as the client is told contemporaneously that as a result of these instructions, there will be an extra charge. So that is certainly something you see catered for. Um, taking it back to, to the position of these particular solicitors, um, there is simply um, no evidence to show what their, what their wider commercial practices um, would have been. But I mean, all one can see is that in this case, not as a response to any sort of complaint from Ms. Belsner, and notwithstanding that point which your Lordship has, has adverted to, where um, I, I, think, I think the precise facts were she asked to have updates more frequently, and she was told that having um, more um, frequent uh, uh, updates might lead to irrecoverable cost. Notwithstanding that, um, they, they, they voluntarily and without any prior request limit their charges in the way that I've described. Yes. Um, and uh, whether or not, and, and, and no doubt that is a mixture of, 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 of both 
um, a desire for good relations with clients, but also commercial prudence. Because as I have said, if, if they had tried to um, even approach some of the worst case scenarios which Mr. Justice Lavender posited, um, then um, they would probably have had an even more painful experience than they have hitherto had. Now, I'm conscious, Mr. Williams, that we've been inter interrupting, as we often do. You didn't, you didn't, um, you didn't pull a <laughs> silent cord. We are Trappist virtues that sorely try. But you have only really today to get through some quite meaty points. Yes. And particularly the fiduciary duty points and the section 70 points. So um, it, would it be a good idea that we, we let you um, move on? Move on. Well, I, I, it's not really for me to say. But, uh, but, um, if, if, I, if, I think it's best if we try and. I mean, we did look at these documents last time. We yes, well, I, well, I got them noted up. I yes, I'm obliged, my lord. Well, I wasn't, in fact, wasn't, there were only, actually, the only, um, for, I was only going to show you, I think, two more things. The first ties in uh, um, to, to the point that my lord, the Chancellor, put to me um, uh, um, about uh, um, uh, the, 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 what would happen if they went to the Ombudsman and so on. And I said, well, yes, but it's not just regulatory rights, it's contractual rights as well. I was mm. just, just going to remind the court what, the, what the, the duties the contract imposes on the solicitors. Yeah. So, so that's the that, that's the law society conditions, which are page three forty hard copy three four one soft copy. Yeah. Uh, I know I showed uh, uh, your lordships this last time, but there are express responsibilities to to act in your best interests. This is the top third of the page. Explain to you the risks and benefits of taking legal action, and I would certainly um, accept that that would include the, the cost the cost risks and benefits, the cost benefit mm. analysis. Um, and then give you the best information possible about the likely cost of your claim for damages. So if, 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 if one of these sort of black swan um, situations eventuates and, and the solicitors do try to take a huge cut of the damages or, 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 or uh, in, in, the world, in, in the words from Henry V, you know, they, they drink the cup and all, um, they, um, they're in breach of these obligations quite apart from, from their regulatory obligations and it's inevitable there's going to be a correction whether it be the means of assessment or ombudsman or just a professional negligence claim. Yeah. Um, and indeed the SRA, I mean, this would be meat and drink for the SRA. You've got, you've, got, um, you've got clear contractual obligations to explain risks and benefits and give the best possible information about costs. Well, you, you, you've issued proceedings and incurred £3,000 of costs and you've got back £600 and you've tried to charge her the difference. There would be, uh, um, this is not a, uh, my, my argument in, in this case is not in my respect for submission taking clients to um, a place of peril. Um, the only other um, points I, I wanted to um, specifically um, identify um, is that there's the standard terms and conditions. The one has at um, page 347-348. slash um, they've also um, they, 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 they've also got expressed warnings that um, an interparties recovery isn't likely to be an indemnity. It means in practice there may be a proportion of costs which you will have to bear yourself. Um, 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 and then there's the usual warning that you don't normally recover all of your costs. That's at 18. Um, and at 19, it is made clear that there will be a shortfall. Um, so sorry, that they are liable for the shortfall. Um, but th th there are countervailing responsibilities, and again, that feeds into the point I've just made at 22. We will give you the best possible information about the likely overall costs. We will tell you as soon as possible if we think our charges might be higher than any estimate or other indication of cost that has been given. Um, um, and, and at 31, that's over the page, they, they haven't, I mean, ironically, I appreciate because it's referred to in contentious matters, which begs a, begs a certain question. Um, but one of their express obligations is to consider with you whether the likely outcome of your matter would justify the expense or risk involved, including, if relevant, the risk of paying the other side's costs. And at 34, we agree to treat you fairly and reasonably and recognise that some of you may be vulnerable. Um, uh, we will advise you of any circumstances and risks of which we are aware or consider to be reasonably foreseeable that could affect the outcome of your matter. Now, again, in, in the worst case scenarios posited by the judge, um, there would be a pretty naked breaches of those responsibilities for which the client would have remedies. Um, so my, t my takeaway from the documents, including all the passages I haven't shown you, uh, um, uh, and obviously this also presages the point about Consumer Rights Act, which um, where there are points about terms needing to be transparent and, 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 in, in, and in intelligible language. 
The client is told clearly and repeatedly that she, if she's winning, she's liable to pay her solicitors irrespective of the cost recovered. Um, however, the client is not given uh, the information about fixed costs, which would enable her to perceive there is a theoretical risk of a substantial shortfall. But the remedy for that was supplied ex post facto by the voluntary cap. Um, th that is not, as I have said, a pure product of goodwill. It is also a product of the promises made to the client, contractual promises. The solicitors will always act in her best interests. They should be given the best possible cost information, and there will be cost, cost updates and risks analyses. And she's given multiple avenues in the event of dissatisfaction. And again, I haven't taken you to them again, but um, the um, documents all repeatedly refer to her rights to complain and her rights of recourse to the ombudsman. Um, and a, 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 another point which I, 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 I haven't taken you to, but in, within the CFA, the solicitor actually con contracts out of a statutory regime which might have limited the client's right to assessment because um, it's a standard law society agreement that CFA is said not to be a contentious business agreement. Um, and a contentious business agreement, if it had been a contentious business agreement, that would have limited the client's right to assessment um, and the solicitor contracts out of that. And that's at um, that, that term, because I can see my Lord the Chancellor of, uh, looking through the pages, I don't know if that's no. in response to what I've just said. No. That term is at page 336, hard copy, page 337, soft copy. It's not said to be an uncontentious business agreement, as Mr. Brett mistakenly said. It, it is not. That was, uh, uh, yes. I, uh, and of course, it, it, it isn't an uncontentious business agreement because it is capable of covering contentious business. Get it. I get it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, but, but yes, and, and, and we'll come may, maybe to some of those points. Um, Can I just be clear which bits of paper the client receives and when? Yes. As far as I'm aware, and I will be corrected from behind if this is wrong, um, the, the narrative begins with the attendance notice of the 7th of March, which your Lordship mm. has at 3.30 slash 3.31. Thank you. That's the, when I say slash 3.31, that's the PDF numbering. Uh, it's a very short note. So there's a telephone call. She goes through the quest questionnaire. That, I suspect, is the document your Lordship referred to earlier that has the partner's name on it. Um, agree to post the client care documentation, verbal authorization given by the client to submit the CNF as long as possible. If you're not familiar with that jargon, that's the claims notification form under yeah. the online protocol. So, so as a result of that, she then gets the client care letter covering the other documents. Obviously, I took you to the client care letter, my lord, a few moments ago. That's at 364 or 365. And you'll see that that is also dated the 7th of March, so it is dispatched immediately. Um, and it identifies the documents which are sent out in paragraph three. So it's essentially the whole corpus of, um, of, of, of material, both the contractual bits of it, like the um, terms and conditions in the CFA, um, and some due diligence things like identity um, requirements. How many pages in total? Uh, from memory, I think it was about 47, including the non-contractual documents. And I think the contractual documents were 27, but we can check that. Because that, that's actually. So is it all the documents it's from all the, page 330 to page 364? It is all the documents, I think, that appear from, yes, from 331 through to 364. And the rest, because there must and the be rest. Uh, the actual claims notification form somewhere else. Yes. yes. And, and, and this, um, certainly in this, uh, this is not, um, not at all atypical. Um, it's an awful lot to expect an ordinary person to read and understand. Yes, and, and I think it certainly would be fair to say, and I'm sure Mr. Holland may say it, that within the profession there is a, there is a very strong desire to make these documents less cumbersome, not more. But the, obviously, first, there is increasing regulation. Secondly, there is a natural tendency to defensive drafting, which obviously, regrettably, is hugely magnified by cases like this. Defensive drafting has not become less since 2016, since companies like Check My Legal Fees have erupted onto the scene. Defensive drafting has become much more prevalent. Um, so the documents, if anything, have got, 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 got more complicated, not less complicated. And of course, to even sophisticated clients, um, it's a matter of complete dismay or, or incomprehension. But I mean, why can't the, there be a letter? I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm forgiving Mr. Holland spoke to me, I didn't quite hear. Why can't there be a letter 
I mean, we look at the client care letter at 331, which probably uh, she could be expected to... Am I got the page right? 364. No, three, um, three, three, three. Oh, it's the letter three six four, isn't it? Oh, okay. Is, is it? Three, six, no, oh, no, no. The client care letter is three six four. Or three six five electronically. Okay. Now that is three pages. Would we be unreasonable in expecting four pages, five pages? Oh dear, six pages. Seven pages. Yes, seven seven in total. Would we be unreasonable in to expect everything that was really significant to be in there? Well, I mean, it's a bit like the civil procedure rules. <laughs> they, they, they were meant to be much shorter and 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 uh, less le less technical than the rules of the Supreme Court, and we all know what happened. Um, and I'm afraid these 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 documents they tend to grow like topsy, um, and people don't go back and redraft them from scratch. They just and they, 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 just, they just got edited and accumulated and bits were added onto them. Uh, of course, if you go off to a skilled uh, contractual draftsman, um, then uh, well, with, with experience in sort of a fairly technical area of legislation around um, conditional fees uh, um, and contentious among contentious business and so on, it could all be made uh, uh, more condensed. It, wouldn't be, it, it couldn't be made, I suspect, um, less than a dozen or so pages. But even the Law Society Standard CFA, that, that's what we've got here. I mean, that's a substantial document. And that was a document with this court, as Mr. Holland says, was actually commended by this court in Holland and Russell. No, I'm, I'm talking about the client care letter. Yes. I mean, my Lord, Lord Justice Nugy put to you that what the client wants to know is how much it's going to cost me, what happens if I lose, what happens if I win. Yeah. Um, at the very least, surely, the key elements of that ought to be in the well, I have not I, even the forty-seven pages accompanying. Well, I certainly, I certainly agree um, that um, the more that one can convey, the more that one can strip down that is which essential and uh, convey it, or at least summarise it with cross references into a relatively plain English letter, like a uh, like a, a relatively plain English document, like a letter, mm. rather than legal small print, um, mm. is unquestionably, um, uh, you know, that's unquestionably uh, um, a preferable course. Um, and I'm sure you know, solicitors would like to do it. But a lot of these firms, they won't have the expertise um, to do it in-house. They're, 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 they're firms which have been um, set up to deal with small uh, personal injury cases. So, and, and, and many of them may not have um, the wherewithal uh, to go off to, say, a commercial firm of solicitors to draft uh, terms which are um, uh, less sprawling. Um, and it is, it, is, it is right to say um, that, obviously, we're here concerned uh, which what we've already seen is some fairly you know, technical and arcane um, 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 rules around um, contentious and uncontentious business and CFAs. That's not the only thing solicitors are subject to. There's, there's, the, consumer, the, 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 there's the consumer contracts, additional information and additional charges and cancellation regulations 2013, for example, and, and you know, all of these things. Uh, um, uh, there, there are requirements in the SRA to give um, briefings about... Um, um, uh, equality um, and complaints uh, and diversity and, and these things and then of course there's all the obligations on, around data protection and data retention policies as well so I mean, it, it's pre it is quite challenging for small firms of solicitors that do not have their own you know, in-house contractual drafts people you know, to, 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 um, to do this in, 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 in a perfect way but I'm certainly not it's certainly not part of my case that what the way it's been gone about in this case is perfect uh, um, it, it isn't uh, um, and I'm sure um, lessons have been learned. And I mean, I can certainly say from experience that the, 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 the relatively small number of us at the bar who, you know, by a strange conjunction of circumstances, have, have ended up having some knowledge in this area. I mean, in recent years, probably as a reaction to people like Check My Legal Feast, the amount of instructions that come in saying, will you please go through our retainer documents and give them a sort of complete overhaul and make sure you know, they're tidy and clear and so on. I mean, that, that, that's been a very significant um, um, part of, 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 of people's practice in certain areas of the bar in recent years. So you know, this is, as I've said before, it's an area where things have been developing um, but, you know, against the background of a great deal of change and obviously where the main function of these solicitors is to get their clients' compensation. It isn't, um, it, and some of these things it had a greatness thrust upon them retrospectively because nobody anticipated 
um, solicitor client detailed assessment proceedings probably back in the time when these documents were drafted. I, I don't think it's unfair to say that before 2013, a solicitor in a known client assessment in a personal injury case was, was as rare as a hen's tooth. Um, because in the pre-Jackson world, almost invariably clients promise you will not have to pay anything. If, if, if you win, we'll take what we get from the other side. Because there were no fixed costs, um, um, uh, no fixed profit costs, and, um, and the success here was recoverable from the opponents. And obviously all that changed from 2013 um, with the introduction of the various new regimes. Um, and it, I, 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 I've accepted that this firm of solicitors, and no doubt many others, um, didn't immediately catch up with their paperwork to uh, the extent of perfection. But what I certainly do say is they did catch up in their commercial practices because whatever the criticisms that we can all make of their documentation in terms of how they treated their clients, not under compulsion, but completely voluntarily, without any sort of complaint, uh, um, um, is, is in my respectful submission beyond criticism. You said that before 2013 there were no fixed costs. Some of the material we have suggests that, that going back a long way, historically, there was an established regime of scale costs in the yeah. county court. Do we know what solicitors used to do there? Did they just charge their clients scale costs and not, and not try and charge more? Well, we simply the, not know. The, 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 uh, well, the, 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 the answer is that um, the first, I, I, I'll mention scale costs a little bit later perhaps, but um, the first point to note is scale costs operated in a radically different way because the scale costs actually had provision both for assessments between the parties and between solicitor and clients. And for example, the judge conducting the solicitor-client assessment could, as a matter of discretion, assess on a higher scale as between solicitor and client than between the parties. Um, and so you, you could, for example, have particulars of claim that were taxed at one figure between the parties and a much higher figure between solicitor and client. The, the other point to note, and I'm afraid I can't give you chronologically precisely when, but there was a point, as, you, as your lordship may know, there used to be about five scales, and I think by the time we got to 1999, there were just two. By the time we got to 1999, scale two was basically uncapped because the district judges had discretion to depart um, from, from, from scale two costs um, whenever they thought the circumstances <coughs> merited it. So the reality is that section 7443, for example, had become, a, had become a dead duck even before the CPR because the scales had ceased, in fact, to impose maximums. So they, they were essentially, or scale two at least, had essentially become a sort of default mechanism from which there was always discretion to depart. I think I'm right about that. I, 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 I do accept that, that in, in saying some of that, I'm, I'm actually th throwing my mind back to my own extremely early years in practice, but, but that's certainly how I understand the position, and it's certainly consistent with the reading that I've done for the purposes of today. Um, if it does help, I don't expect it does, but I, I would agree with that. Um, um, sorry. Well, it does help, so I'm grateful <laughs> Um, so um, I think um, I was then going to um, make a few remarks about the difference between inter-parties and solicitor and client costs. Um, and I'm, we deal with this in our skeleton at 26 and 28. Uh, um, really, um, the determination of inter-parties costs, uh, irrespective of the distinction between contentious and non-contentious, has always differed substantially uh, from costs between solicitor and client. And in this respect, in our skeleton, we cite what Mr Justice Lavender himself says in the SGI case. Lordships would have said, where he, he, he quite accepts it's different. And also what's said in the White Book's cost supplement, and I'm not going to invite you to turn it up given the time constraints, but we quote it in our skeleton. It says it's a fundamental distinction. Um, and historically, a key distinction um, um, is and was the cost between solicitor and client are assessed on the indemnity basis. And that means they're not subject to any test of proportionality. So that's in itself a significant difference uh, from the vast majority of inter-parties assessments. Um, and the introduction of fixed costs was never intended to abrogate that. And I, I think that's the point that my Lord the Master of put to me in, 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 in saying, well, we, we can trace all the, this back to Lord Justice Jackson. Um, because as you've seen, Lord Justice Jackson says in terms his reforms did not impact um, on what solicitors charge their clients. So we, we quote that at paragraph 26. And I won't invite you to turn it up because um, from the Master of the Rose's remarks, you, you're clearly alive to it. Um, but a point I did um, want to um, perhaps develop slightly is we say the introduction of fixed costs has made the divergence between inter-parties costs and solicitors' costs even more stark 
uh, because while the latter remains subject to assessment, inter-parties fixed costs are not subject to assessment at all. So we now have regimes, um, whereas we used to have a regime where costs were assessed but in a different way, um, now um, inter-parties costs in, in the cases subject to the scheme, there's no assessment of solicitor charges at all, whereas between solicitor and client, uh, there is still an assessment. So one is now in, 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 in two utterly different systems, which diverge rather more, we would suggest, than merely the, the traditional divergence of, between apples and pears. One is, is actually uh, comparing things which are quite different. And, and, and the reason I mention that is we say it has a bearing on the question of statutory interpretation to come. Uh, because we say that if, if it is seen that the fixed cost into party system is in fact radically different from the system for determining costs between solicitor and client, then that in due course raises a real question as to whether there could possibly have been any legislative intent to connect the re remuneration of solicitors by their own clients to the current inter-parties regime for fixed costs. And on any view, we say the divergence bears on the argument of the learned friends that section 74.3 should be given what they call an updating construction so that it does link solicitors' remuneration in county court cases Inter parties fixed costs because if, if, if we say that the, the proposition that there should be some sort of strained updating construction is immediately falsified when you see you're actually dealing with starkly different regimes of an, an inter parties fixed regime, um, which is, 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 is not subject to any sort of assessment, um, and a statutory regime which, which sort of survives in section 74.3, which whatever it else may be is. Clearly, we will submit a regime which is still meant to turn on there being an assessment of the items which the solicitor charges. Um, and, and since the last hearing, the relationship between fixed costs and assessed costs has been reviewed by this court, um, which has itself stressed that they are quite different systems. And that's the case called Doyle and M&D Foundations. Forgive me, I'm afraid my, to the end of my password. Um, and that is in the authorities bundle, um, for those using it electronically, it's page 1294. Um, um, or, or for those um, with hard copy, it's tab 50, page um, 1283. So the PDF number is 1294. In fact... No, that's Mr. Justice Butcher. Sorry, I'm, I'm slightly, I'm slightly behind. It, 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 it's, it's one two eight five hard copy, one two eight six soft copy. Yeah. Um, what I was going to do. This is this is a case um, where um, there had been a settlement. Why are you looking at this? Um, because it's um, because it's um, it, it, it enlarges on the the complete difference of character between fixed and assessed costs. And it's a run-up to a point that I know... Isn't that completely obvious? Well, if you think it's completely obvious, I mean, what I will... I mean, just show us what, the, what they say. Because yeah, all right. Mm. Well... You know, this wasn't Don't worry about the facts, that's just how No, very good. So it's really the sideline passages beginning at paragraph 32, which is 1293 or 4, depending on soft, soft or hard copy. They were unanimous, were they? They were unanimous. Lord Justice Phillips giving the judgment. He cites Lord Justice Moore Big. Yes, so we got Lord Justice Moore Big, who's there saying um, th this is a previous fixed cost regime intended um, to provide a consistent outcome that's fair across a broad range of cases. Um, um, and it, it isn't, and he says it's not meant to replicate standard basis assessment. Um, and then you've got Lord Dyson saying that uh, it's, not, it's not the same thing in Broadhurst and Tan. Exactly. And then further down the sideline, you've got Lord Justice Briggs, as he then was, who's making clear that really the driver of the fixed cost regimes is to identify between the parties a sort of rough justice by which you get costs which are proportionate. Yeah. Now that in my submission is again it's important when one starts to ask yourself, well, is there an intention that the fixed costs should be any sort of measure of costs between solicitor and client, which is, uh, which is my... Um, my learned friend's case, when as we've seen, f firstly, they don't involve assessment, and assessment is still central to cost between solicitor and client. Uh, se second, they don't even involve um, an attempt to replicate a standard basis assessment, which means they're even more distant 
um, from a, a, an assessment between solicitor and client, which is indemnity basis. And thirdly, that in the fixed cost rules, um, proportionality has been absolutely essential uh, to the thinking, which again, in our respectful submission, shows immediately that there should be no sort of starting point of there being any sort of intention to assimilate fixed cost rules to what solicitors can charge their clients, because proportionality simply is not part of what solicitors can charge their clients, as I've sought already to show. Um, so uh, that, I think, um, brings me to section 74, and I will, uh, um, the, se the section 74 uh, um, points, um, which um, I will follow my uh, Lord's, the Master of Law's injunction to try to take fairly shortly. Um, the, 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 the Solicitors Act, as we've seen, distinguishes between contentious and non-contentious business. And as we say in our skeleton, and everyone seems to agree, in historic terms, the reason why that was an important distinction isn't in fact so much because it leads to a radically different way in which costs are quantified on assessment, but it's, it's, it's actually because of the different ways in which solicitors have been permitted to charge in contentious and non-contentious business. Uh, because um, the, the well-known prohibition, prohibition on contingency fee agreements, by, by which I'm, I'm here using really to mean, mean any um, agreement whereby a solicitor is paid by outcome, whether it be a percentage agreement or CFA or whatever, uh, that never applied to non-contentious business. Uh, so, um, and that's why um, one has always had contingency fee agreements in the employment tribunals, for example. Now, those are now regulated, uh, um, as it happens. They're subject to their own regulations for consumer protection. But, but they were never illegal at common law, and they uh, continue to be regulated differently from contingency fee agreements in contentious business, um, which have been permitted since 2000, no, since 1995 for conditional fee agreements, and since 2013 for damages-based agreements, uh, which uh, is, is the English jargon for, for, for what might be called an American-style um, contingency fee retainer. Um, and that's why both we and the Law Society have said, with respect, it's very important for the profession and, um, and its clients for the demarcation between contentious and non-contentious business to be clear and consistent, uh, because uh, parties will have transacted um, on the um, um, assumption, um, if we're right, that um, it's non-contentious business up to the point that proceedings are issued. And therefore, for example, you can have a contingency fee agreement up to that point which doesn't need to comply with the regulations for damages-based agreements. Um, and I, while I'm not suggesting for a moment it is anything other than a, 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 a quirk which might give rise to a whimsical smile, it is um, an irony I can't um, help but comment on that we um, actually can now see from another case about security for costs that check my legal fees themselves use a contingency fee agreement until the point that proceedings are issued and at the point that proceedings are issued they've got a CFA. Uh, and, and that's no criticism of them, it's just that this orthodoxy, which in their skeleton uh, they um, pour scorn on, they have um, themselves uh, uh, been honouring it in the way they structured their own arrangements. And as I think I said last time, you can also see that in another aspect of this case, which is which it is in the High Court. Uh, because um, if, it, if it had been a contentious case, they could have issued proceedings for assessment in the County Court, because the County Court does have jurisdiction to assess bills for contentious business of less than £5,000, which this case was. But they, are, they apply, we say, rightly to the High Court, because it isn't, in fact, contentious business. Now, so far as the statutory definition um, is concerned, I've absolutely no doubt your Lordship sort of pulled over it. Um, I'm going to turn up the hard copy for this one. So it's the statutory materials, tab one. Um, and the, I'm going to take as my starting point, in fact, the, the, the contentious business, non-contentious business definition, which um, is um, at uh, page, um, page uh, well, it, it, it's section 87, which begins on page 30 of the hard copy, so 31 of the PDF, but the definitions themselves are over the page. And it's the top of the page, contentious business means business done whether as a solicitor or advocate in or for the purpose of proceedings begun before a court or before an arbitrator, um, not being business which falls within the definition of non-contentious or common form probate business contained elsewhere. So it is business done 
for the purposes of proceedings begun before a court. And non-contentious business is then um, defined in negative terms as business which is not contentious business. And we, 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 we say that whatever one may think of the philosophy behind it, the statutory language is strikingly clear. Uh, um, and it is absolutely clear that you are not in contentious business until your proceedings um, have, been, have been begun. Uh, um, and, and therefore, the, pre the instant case is non-contentious business. Um, and uh, we also say that that is a distinction which has been well recognised uh, um, because it comes from the 1957 Act. It's been well recognised for over 60 years um, and uh, it, it's reflected in the Law Society's advice, which Mr Holland will come to, um, no doubt. Um, um, and it is, a, it is a settled distinction in reliance on which um, uh, um, solicitors and clients will have transacted on a daily basis throughout the jurisdiction. Uh, <clears throat> how does Mr Kirby try and get round the very stark words begun before the court? Well, I mean, if you'd like me um, just to move on... Uh, to, on this sub point, I mean, you uh, say that's the beginning and the end. We of say it's the beginning and end of it, and, and I. It's and in section seventy four three. Uh, it, it's even clearer in one sense. Proceed any item relating to proceedings in the county court, and then lower down it says a, a, between party and party in those proceedings. Yes, which is clearly a reference back to proceedings in the county court. Indeed, and and of By course, definition, if there never are any. So there are no proceedings in the county court, full stop. With so you can look at what proceedings might or might not mean in another piece of legislation, but it doesn't help us as to what it means in section 74.3. Well, well, my lord, um, there it is. Yes. Yeah. yes. And, 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 and and why has this point caused such difficulty with um, district judges and high court judges? Well, I'm I mean, not. It just strikes me as completely bizarre. I mean, Mr. Justice Lavender seemed desperate in the two cases not to decide it. Well, I, I, I mean, obviously, I didn't appear below, so I can't help with that. I mean, what I do know is it's obviously a, a very bizarre feature of this case that we took it in front of the district judge. We lost it and we didn't renew it. But, I mean, I've taken instructions as to why that could be for what it's worth. Changed his mind. And, I mean, the, 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 the simple point is we won in front of the district judge. I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, we'd have put in a response notice reviving this point, but we thought we'd win in front of Mr Justice Lavender. Um, and, it, and, and there may have been a degree of overconfidence. But as you've seen in the sequel case, SGI... Um, uh, um, this is just Bellamy, I don't mean it disrespectfully, but in this case, first instance, we had two cost draftsmen. Um, in, 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 in the sequel case, um, this is just Bellamy has, has Robert Marvin QC arguing the points, and he finds he's been wrong, and it is contentious business. And, um, uh, um, and on, on that occasion, it's CMLF that don't appeal it in time. They try to appeal it eight, month, eight months late, and the, um, I think it's eight months late, and, the, and the, his lordship refuses relief from sanction. Um, what I do, we all, I, I, I don't mean it disrespectfully, but I think in the last case there was a certain amount of belly aching from, from my learned friend Mr Kirby about, well, this appeal's being thrown off course by a new point that wasn't even taken below. He wanted to lay down his marker for costs. But you'll have, you'll have what I've now seen in the SGI case, it's Mr Kirby that's setting the call. This is a very important point which urgently needs to be resolved. And obviously it's my invitation to your lordships to resolve it in my direction. Hmm. Very good. When we look at the text of Section 74 that we have in the bundle, um, you can see that the words in the county court have been substituted. Do we know what the original text was? Uh, I th from memory, I think that's just to reflect the creation of a unitary county court instead of the county courts, um, which I can't remember when that particular reform in this frenetic world was, but that was about a decade ago, I think. Uh, but we, we can check that. And, and uh, I don't know if your lordship knows about the ellipsis of the subsection. The Courts Act 2013, according to the footnotes. Well, I'm much, much, yes, uh, yes, I should Yes, whereas the, the, the heading still says business done in county courts. In county yes. Courts, yeah. Which is what we used to have before there was one court. Indeed, yeah. Yeah. indeed. Um, and, and if your lordship's interested, the, the ellipsis of subsection 2, um, I think we've all looked at that to make sure it, it didn't throw light, but that was all about the division between district judges and circuit judges. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, um, no one suggests that that is relevant. But, and obviously, we, we, all the points that were put to me by my, my Lord the Chancellor, um, it's also the point, um, obviously, that subsection 1 refers to contentious business done in the county court, um, and then subsection 3 is a continuum because subsection 1 says, shall have effect subject to the following provisions of this section. Mm -hmm. And this is all part of a, of, a wider, um, of a wider structure in this part 3 of the Act, which distinguishes non-contentious and contentious business and makes a series of important distinctions about, for example, 
non-contentious versus contentious business agreements, different regulatory regimes, um, different regimes of billing. Contentious bills can be gross sum, non-contentious bills can't. Um, uh, the earlier provision about the county court's jurisdiction, the county court has jurisdiction for contentious business um, of less than £5,000, but not for non-contentious business. So it is part, just part of, for good or for ill, a, 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 a settled um, decision, a, 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 a settled policy to distinguish between costs incurred in court proceedings and costs incurred in non-court proceedings, and our submission is that these are non-court proceedings. Um, I, I think, g given um, the way your Lordship has put matters to me, um, I won't take you to the various authorities and commentary which we cite in this skeleton. I'll, I'll do it as necessary in, in, in reply. Um, my, my Lord, you know I do have a second point about this, which I, I, I think in, in, um, encountered a certain turbulence on the last occasion, which is that I also said that even if I'm wrong about that, um, this is it's, it's my sort of not so much apples and pears as, 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 as nutmegs and pumpkins or whatever sort of this, as, as, um, whatever sort of radically different comparison one might choose is to say also that the predicate of 743 uh, um, isn't in fact fixed cost a fixed cost system like the current interparty system at all because section 743 as, as, as we've seen it is it addresses the amount that might be allowed on the assessment of any um, a bill between solicitor and client. So between solicitor and client, there is an assessment. Um, and what that says is, is that in that assessment, uh, um, the solicitor shall not, except as far as rules of court may otherwise provide, exceed the amounts which could have been allowed in respect of the given item as between party and party in the proceedings, having regard to the nature of the proceedings and the amount of the claim. So in, in my submission also, I, I, I do um, submit that what 74.3 is actually addressed at is the largely defunct, but not completely defunct, scheme of scale costs. And, and, and there, is a, there is a further fallacy in my learned friend's approach to this, which is they are trying to graft on a fixed cost scheme which simply got nothing to do um, with what the statutory draftsperson um, um, kind of anticipated. Because what the uh, draftsman is here anticipating is an assessment of cost between solicitor and client um, where items are considered, um, and a comparison between what is claimed in that assessment with, 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 what, with what would have eventuated on assessment uh, um, between client and opponent in the inter-parties litigation um, in respect of the given item of costs. So, and, and, and that is a translation of the scale scheme, where to, 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 to those who remember it, um, there was, of course, just a, a, a list of different events in the litigation. This is what you get for particulars of claim. This is what you get for defences. So you just wouldn't get more than that unless you complied with the terms of the section. And you wouldn't get more than that if you... And, and in fact, in, in, in back in those days, as my learned friend Mr Holland says in his skeleton, no rule of court was made um, which disapplied uh, section 7.3. No, no. mm. But the answer was you didn't need to under the old system because the scales supplied their own answer, as I've said, yeah. which is the scales did allow a discretion for the district judge to give up this and so the registrar as it then would yeah. be to give up this. Now again, there is no replication of that in the fixed cost schemes, we say again, precisely because they were never intended to be connected in any way to remuneration. Your real point is about the word could, because your real point is that the, the section does not say um, what it's sort of uh, reported as saying, which is you can't recover more than you get from yes. the other side, it's that you can't recover more than you could have been in what? respect of that item. Yes, and, and what it is envisaging, therefore, is, I, I, with your lordship, with respect on that, but also, and you could have got where in an assessment of items, and there is no assessment of items under the fixed cost rules, as we've just seen from Lord Justice Phillips. It is just a radically different system, founded on concepts like proportionality, which are completely alien to costs between solicitor and client. And each of the items does have a carve-out. Um, under well, the, 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 under the scales, um, you know, it evolved over, um, over years. We do have one one version of the scales in the uh, um, in the in, in the bundle, which I'm not proposing to take you to, given your lordship's injunction. But I can if you want. No, um, but, um, I think the answer is that in in the list of items, there are some marked with an asterisk and some aren't. The ones marked with an asterisk in those days, there was a discretion to allow more. I think there are some which are not asterisk. Um, but as I've said, more, perhaps more fundamentally, the district judge was specifically endowed with the jurisdiction to assess costs, for example, on a higher scale between solicitor and clients. And, and again, all that makes sense as a as a as a um, as a comprehensive system. Uh, um, 
um, and so assimilating what we have here with the county court scales, the old county court scales makes complete sense as, as, as an entire scheme. In my perspective, it simply breaks down when you try to do what my learned friends do, which is to say, well, in 2013, um, in fidelity to Lord Justice Jackson, a new scheme was devised. And notwithstanding Lord Justice Jackson says it's got nothing to do with inter-parties costs, by a by-blow, it, it unintentionally controls how solicitors are remunerated between themselves and their client. And in uh, my perspective, submission, that, that is, you'll forgive the cliche, it is, is hammering the square peg into the round hole. And, and, and so there are two ways, not one, in which my learned friends are mistaken in their statutory <coughs> <coughs> um, I, 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 I did have a series of points I was going to make in response to my learned friend's skeleton on these issues, but I will reserve those for a, a reply. Um, um, yes, I, I, I should, should also say my, 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 my learned friends, one thing I will say, my, 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 my learned friends also place considerable emphasis on the word proceedings. And they do make the fair point that in various different cases, proceedings have been treated in a fairly mutable way. There are some cases where it's been interpreted as, as meaning court proceedings and others where it hasn't. But here in our submission, those arguments simply beat the air because the definitions we've just seen are completely clear about the sort of proceedings the Solicitors Act is here addressing, those proceedings in the county court, which proceedings, in inverted commas, under the pre-action protocols are not. Um, and indeed, the protocol, I mean, the whole aim of the protocol is that it operates in order for such proceedings to be uh, avoided. Um, so I'm skipping an awful lot, so if you'll just forgive me as I reorder myself. Um, oh, I perhaps, again, I think I may have made some of these points um, s s um, previously, and if I do apologise. I, um, I would also say that the proposition that, that trying to graft fixed into parties' costs onto solicitor client costs through the medium of section 74.3, it does um, face um, a, 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 a other um, objections um, in our um, submission. Because, for example, the fixed into party schemes only relate to claimant's costs. Um, so how can it possibly be the case that whether section 74.3 uh, applies turns on whether you're acting for a claimant or whether you're acting for somebody else. And, and of course, the fixed inter-party schemes, or certainly the ones we're here concerned with, um, once you get into cases which leave the protocol, um, the amount of costs you get um, are calculated with reference to the amount of damages recovered. It's a percentage of the damages plus a, plus a fixed sum. So, 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 so but, but if, 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 if this was intended to regulate costs between solicitor and client, you don't just need to um, regulate the cost which are payable in the event of a win. You also have to regulate the cost which are payable in the event of a loss. Well, the fixed cost system doesn't work to do that because, because, you, because it, it works as a percentage of the damages. So, 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 so it, it's simply incapable of providing for cases where, where parties are unsuccessful. Uh, and for that reason also, it's obviously incapable of dealing with, 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 with uh, costs payable by defendants because defendants don't uh, recover damages. Um, and so, it, and that's another reason why we, we say one really is um, um, uh, trying to hammer into Section 74 something which manifestly could not have been intended. Uh, so it's not just a question of being right about contentious business in our respectful submission. I do maintain the point, which as I recognise was not uh, received um, with entire sympathy on the last occasion, that um, this point about what is actually being envisaged are assessments of items um, uh, um, it really does show we're talking about plain different things. And I'd also, without um, departing from my self-imposed um, uh, ordinance of waiting to reply, I, I also do say it's the answer to updating construction. There, there's no possible updating construction that one should embark on in order to, to force into Section 74.3 something which se Section 74.3 simply is not addressed to in our submission. So, um, my Lord, those are my, 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 my points on that. Well, on, I think in, in terms of the list of issues, it's, it's out of sequence, but I think logically, um, it's if, I'm right on, if I'm right on this, I ought to address issue five, which is the position, if we're right on section 74.3, um, what are the consequences? In our respectful submission, there are no consequences, um, because District Judge Bellamy assessed the costs. 
Um, and uh, no one um, in our respectful submission has made any serious case that he would assess them differently um, if he'd been applying a test of fairness and reasonableness rather than reasonableness alone. And I also do respectfully remind the court uh, that because of the self-imposed cap, the costs which District Judge Bellamy assessed are actually considerably more than the costs which the solicitors claimed. They're about 40% more. So, so even if one took the view that on a non-contentious assessment, for whatever reason, there might have been a, a slightly greater degree of austerity um, in the district judge's assessment. Um, the proposition that that would reduce the cost from the cost he assessed, which to remind you, you, your, your lordship, he found that the cost which would have been reasonable between solicitor and client, basic charges only, would have been £1,392 um, as compared to the £821 odd claim. So there's an enormous ceiling there. Um, but in our submission, one doesn't even need to resort to a practical answer like that. On the facts of this case, in our submission, there is no reason to suppose that the assessment would have proceeded differently. And again, I, I do, by way of illustrating that, respectfully remind the court that if you look at the non-contentious assessment that was conducted in the SGI case, you simply cannot discern a difference. The district judge does the same thing. He yeah. looks at the time spent, he reduces it. He looks at the hourly rate rates, he reduces it. Uh, uh, um, um, and he gets to a figure which neither side in, in, in our case has complained about. Um, in the other case, I think Mr Marvin's first appeal, um, there, um, there were some unsuccessful points trying to challenge the district judge's assessment, and as I understand it, none of them are renewed to this court. And District Judge Bellamy is a very experienced cost judge, is he not? Well, I think he's now retired, but he was the regional cost judge for his circuit. Yes. Yes, so he, um, uh, um, and uh, I imagine he was leading a, a tranquil life uh, uh, um, sitting in Sheffield until a check my legal fees opened in Sheffield. Uh, um, I, I is... don't know uh, whether you've recently been to Sheffield, but uh, that court is not all that tranquil. But uh, it's quite a busy court. It is a very yeah. busy court. Yeah. Yes, I was. I was. I. I. I, I well, I, I suppose I meant with his regional, the, the regional cost judge side of his, his of his uh, judicial duties may have been relatively tranquil uh, until um, uh, um, a sudden influx of these cases came because of the happenstance of where a particular firm of solicitors set up shop. My Lord, I think that, that therefore um, takes me to the contracting out issues, um, and, and that's issues three and four. And that clearly entails, firstly, looking um, at how um, rule... Um, oh, actually, I've just occurred to me, I haven't addressed the point um, that, again, was, I think, really was, was, was canvassed by members of the court on the last occasion about whether or not CPR um, 46.9 enlarges... Um, the um, jurisdiction um, of section 74. Well, that's, that's, you, you, you say it plainly right. doesn't. And yes. If Mr. Kirby makes headway in persuading I'll reply. It does. You'll reply. Uh, very good. I, um, so, um, so, far as, uh, the, 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 so after that false start, contracting out uh, two main aspects to this. Firstly, how should 46.92 be um, interpreted? Uh, and secondly, the points around fiduciary duty. Um, so let me at least try to um, get um, one of those points um, done before the short adjournment. So, so far as CPR 46.92 is concerned, it's obviously set out in various places. We don't have them above. 46.92. I, I think last time we, we, we went from the white book rather than actually having it in the bundle. Um, let's uh, assume that... What page is it in the bundle? I'm just ascertaining that it is... Not in the statutory. I, say, I think that we, we just relied on the White Book, which was probably slightly short sighted of us in terms of your Lordship's convenience, uh, for which I apologise. Um, no. Yes. Do, 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 do your Lordships have White Books? Um, we do, but I'll look at it online. Thank no, I was going to say, well, of course, it is available from the Court Service the MAJ website. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, so far as um, CPR 46.92 is concerned, our respectful submission is that the words, um, uh, um, the terms are clear. There is a tripartite question 
um, is there um, an agreement, which is in writing, um, where um, the provision for charging in excess of what could be recovered between the parties is expressly permitted. Uh, and we say that is the only uh, point to which um, the um, section directs inquiry. Um, is there um, an express agreement in writing which permits uh, that facility? Um, and uh, we say that um, here there obviously is such an agreement, and I've obviously identified the provisions we rely on. Now, um, the respondent's uh, argument to the contrary is derived from the approach of the court to a neighbouring provision, the, the neighbouring provision in the CPR, which is the point about um, 46.93, um, which is in different language. Um, that, uh, that, um, the, 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 that legislates for certain presumptions, some in favour of the solicitor, some against the solicitor. Um, so the presumptions include that, that the costs are to be presumed to have been reasonably incurred if they are incurred with the express or by the approval of the client. The reasonable amount of fair was expressly or partly approved by the client. The unreasonably reasonably occurred if they are of an unusual nature and amount, and the, the, the solicitor did not tell the client that as a result the cost might not be recovered. Now, um, so far as the um, express or applied approval of the client is concerned in the first two subparagraphs, the approach in previous cases of which Herbert and HH Law is one um, and has been uh, to say uh, that uh, it isn't sufficient to give the client un unadorned information. And uh, you may re recall that when I was asked by my Lord Lord Justice Nuji earlier about the success fee, uh, I made the point that in Herbert, one of the points that was made was, well, if you want to charge for something more than a pure burning cost of risk and delay, then you need to make that clear. Yeah, and, you need, uh, um, and, and, and so that's what's been decided in those cases. And essentially, my learned friend, Mr Kirby, seeks to assimilate, because these are neighbouring provisions, uh, um, <clears throat> assimilate the same principle. Well, it is not enough to have an agreement um, in, 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 in sub rule two, um, you have to have an informed agreement which equates to uh, the sort of informed approval that you need. Yeah, but the problem, the problem with that is the wording of the section. Yes. The, the first wording, sub two, uh, talks about an agreement which expressly permits. The words which expressly permits um, qualify the written agreement. The second wording is talking about incurred with express or implied approval of the client. Yes. Which is a completely different concept altogether, isn't it? Well, that, of course, that is, that is, that is my point. The, the first essentially asks um, a, 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 a factual question as to whether or not there is an agreement which is well, expressed. That's right, because it, uh, following on from my Lord's point, I mean, if, if the respondents were right, then what you'd expect to, to say is there's there must be a written agreement which expressly permits, and there must also be express or implied approval, approval. Yes, well, by exactly. the client on top of the written agreement. Yes. And that's not what it says. Yes, indeed. Well, and that's the point, really. Uh, quite apart from all the other points about the fact that the, the history of these two provisions is one of them is relatively recent and one of them goes back to, as it were, the 1960s. Of time, certainly. Yes. The 1960s. Yeah, and in fact, I think, yes. Um, and, and, and uh, yes, uh, and I suspect further back, but, but that's certainly as far as, as we... Uh, that is you don't get anything from 46.91, because that's simply dealing with the circumstances in which the rule itself applies. It's not saying there's some overarching point that has to be applied in every single case. With, with of express and impli or implied well, approval, for with, example. With, 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 with respect, that is correct. And really, that's the point. It is, well, it's, a ling it's, it's a linguistic point. It's, it's, it's short and... Sweet. Well, again, it's a reply point. Well, it's a re I'm, I'm happy to leave it there un unless yeah. I need to. You can, you can move on to Pagan's duty. Well, um, let's. Um, so, the judge's conclusion um, that a, a, a written agreement, uh, more than a written agreement, was, acquired, was, 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 acquired, was required um, is founded, as, as we know, um, not on a comparison of the language used that we've just conducted. But on, on his on his um, examination of the fiduciary relationship between solicitor and client, and if one takes up the judgment, um, which is the core bundle, um, <clears throat> page two seven seven, half twenty one, for those in the hard copy. <clears throat> I was 
going to um, start um, at um, 68.70. So at 68, the judge says he doesn't consider the appeal can be determined by a simple comparison between um, the wording of the two rules. Um, and the requirement of informed consent doesn't arise because of approval versus agreement. It arises because of the fiduciary, fiduciary nature of the relationship. And then he says, it goes without saying that agreement for the purposes of 46.92 must be valid and enforceable. It follows, for example, that the agreement procured by fraud or misrepresentation would not suffice. Nor, obviously, he says, would an agreement whose performance would involve a breach of fiduciary duty. And to that extent, informed consent is required. And he develops that at 70. The solicitor who wishes to rely on the rule must not only point to a written agreement which meets the requirements as the defendant did, but he must also show that his client gave informed consent to that agreement insofar as it permitted payment to the solicitor of an amount greater than that which the client could have recovered from the other party to the proceeding. For this purpose, the solicitor must show that he made sufficient disclosure. Um, and and that, that passage builds on, on an earlier passage, which I will, um, just for completeness, Take the court to which appears at page between page 266 and 268. It's paragraphs, paragraphs 34 to 39. Mm -hmm. um, where the paragraph 34, the learned judge asserts the fiduciary duty of the solicitor client relationship and the default principle that a fiduciary may not receive a profit from his office, citing Snell. And then over the following paragraphs, you get a series of cases um, about undisclosed commission taking or, or, or semi-disclosed commission taking. Um, and really, both the passage from Snell at, at 34, uh, which is expressly uh, um, dealing um, with uh, defences, defence of breach of fiduciary duty, and the cases that follow, they're, they're all concerned with whether a fiduciary can rebut um, the rule uh, um, against um, undisclosed commissions or other hidden profits or whatever it may be by, by, um, by, by showing that the principal gave a fully informed consent to the transaction. But in our submission, those are not transactions anything like the transactions here under consideration. Can you help with this? Look at Herstanger, which he cites at 38. Herstanger is an agency case and uh, the agent negotiates for his agency and at the point of contract retainer in our situation the agent takes a secret commission which he has obviously arranged whilst he was negotiating the agency it's binding on us surely uh, that if a solicitor did the same and took a secret commission for gaining your client's instructions, uh, that would be a breach of fiduciary duty at the point of retainer. Yes. Right. Now, it isn't a long way from that to say, well, therefore, in the negotiation, at least that fiduciary duty is owed. Namely, and we can see what the fiduciary duties are by looking at section, is it 172 of the Companies Act? Mm -hmm. Do, do, um, why is it that that fiduciary duty is owed even during the period of negotiation and the, um, the other fiduciary duties which are of um, loyalty and um, putting your client's interests first and etc etc are not owed uh, and what's the answer to that question? Yes well I mean, the answer that I would Suggest so I might want to think about it over the short adjournment is is that the actual the actual act of profit taking um, is 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 going to occur during the currency of the relationship, and so and certainly at that stage the profit taking should be disclosed. Um, uh, and but in my respectful, so I appreciate that we are very close to uh, 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 angels on the head of a pin sort of distinction, but one has to somehow resolve in my respectful submission. How one otherwise get, get, gets over what we say is the conceptual difficulty that a solicitor or, or any other sort of fiduciary or putative fiduciary uh, can owe um, the, the overriding obligation of, of self-subordination, loyalty and avoidance of conflict of interest. At the moment, they're actually stipulating for the terms on which they're willing to 
accept the appointment of the fiduciary position because an Arvis Belfast Commission clearly in that context they are acting in their own interests. And so is the answer then uh, that the solicitor can indeed owe fiduciary duties to the client during the period of negotiation? So say for example there is one retainer and happens all the time, solicitors retained to conduct the litigation, but on the 14th of January, in the middle of the litigation, the solicitor says, actually, I want to renegotiate our retainer because I'm not happy um, with the fees I'm getting and, and I want to charge you more, say. Yes. Period of high inflation, for example. Yes. And the client says, okay, fine, and they enter into negotiations for a different retainer whilst all the while the solicitor continues to act. Is the answer that in that situation the solicitor owes fiduciary duties in respect of everything he does for the client in the retainer that exists, but he does not owe fiduciary duties specifically in relation to his conduct in negotiating um, the new retainer, but only insofar as he's doing that. I'm sorry that it's gender, not gender neutral, but uh, I do my best, but sometimes I fail, I've just failed. Now. Well, I'm sure that's true of all of us. Um, the, the, I mean, clearly, if in the course of, if in the course of the performance of the fiduciary duty, solicitors and clients start negotiating about some, some new transaction, like for example the purchase of a property by the solicitor from the client. Um, one wouldn't one wouldn't in that context say that this because it's uh, because it's known to both parties to be a, a freestanding negotiation that the solicitor is discharged from any fiduciary duty in respect of that negotiation. I mean does this 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 really this idea comes out of Kelly and Cooper, doesn't it? Yes. Mm. Yes. Well, it comes. Yes, yes, it does. Um, I mean, so the the answer might be that once you once you actually once the fiduciary arrangement has actually been established and the solicitor has has accepted, he stipulated terms. They've been negotiated or they've simply been accepted, and the fiduciary position is adopted. That you know, the, from, from from that point from 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 that point there on, um, the solicitor you know, can't transact with his client in an unfettered way. Um, um, even if it be an invitation by the client to retain the term to 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 to, to amend the terms of the appointment, um, him, uh, him or herself. Why is it so difficult to say that the solicitor owes fiduciary duties when negotiating his fee? I mean, the the rule is not that a fiduciary can't profit at the expense of his client, but that he can't profit at, he can't take a secret profit at the expense of his client. And clearly, clients pay for solicitor services. Look, if you move away from solicitors to trustees, yes. which is where all the fiduciary duties start from, trustees, as a matter of law, aren't entitled to take anything for themselves without the informed consent of those whose money it is. But that doesn't stop trustees from charging. It just means when they're charging, they owe duties when they propose to charge. And the law isn't that trustees can charge what they like and line their own pockets as long as they haven't yet started acting. Their fiduciaries are in, in the negotiation for their fees as, as well as everything else. What, what, is the, what is the conceptual problem of saying solicitors, of course, can charge their clients, but they owe duties to clients to make sure the clients give informed consent to the, the profits they derived from so acting. And the answer to Hurst I had when my lord and master of the roles posed the question to me can't be with respect that there's no fiduciary duty owed until um, after the negotiation because if you look at what Lord Justice Tucky said as quoted in the judge's judgment he talks in terms about um, statement of the amount which the broker is to receive from the lender. In other words, it's not talking about what he's actually received, it's talking about what he's, what he's going to receive in the future. 
Yes, yes, I see that. Well, perhaps I can I can have a look at that um, uh, in a little well, yes. more detail over the short adjournment. But so far as I mean, firstly, we, I'm not complaining that we've got stuck into this. But I also wanted to I wanted to make um, the point um, at really at the outset that we we uh, we've really got to, I think we have more lines of attack in our skeleton, but the ones I reduced it to for the purposes of the oral argument, especially the ones we've just been debating as to whether or not there are in fact reduced reduces. Um, as um, yeah. when you're stipulating for your initial terms of appointment. Um, I mean, uh, the, the thing that troubles me about what my Lord, Lord Justice Nugy has put to you is that um, fully informed consent, uh, the relationship between a trustee and a beneficiary is not the same as the relationship between a solicitor mm -hmm. and a client. And fully informed consent is something different from signing an agreement. And if you sign an agreement, um, my sort of um, very commercial contractual history would lead me to think generally you're bound by it, unless you've been misled as to what it says. Um, if a, if a, client, a, a client is sent a an agreement which says, I will pay you £100 an hour, uh, for your services. Um, as I say, my commercial background would lead me to believe that that is an agreement which ought to be enforced by the court um, if it's signed um, electronically even or with wet ink. Now, why do, does express um, fully informed have to be implied in? And, and the reason is, well, because the relationship is a fiduciary one, but so is it with agency, so is it with many other relationships in the law. Um, the law still assumes, doesn't it, that you read what you sign. Well, um, I'm now, and, uh, sorry. just to finish the oh, point, what, what, what I feel uncomfortable about, about this implication, is that the law has imposed duties on solicitors contained in the Code of Conduct that Mr. Holland mm. has told us about in statute, as we see from the 2009 regulations, and elsewhere. Uh, solicitors have lots of duties to do yes. things with their clients. But why should those duties um, be the full gamut of fiduciary duties, which seems to me to imply some kind of duty of good faith mm. um, within the negotiation process which our courts have stood out against. Yes. Well, I mean, and, and where, with respect, I, I was, haven't yet come back directly to my Lord, Lord Justice Nugi, but I mean, where I, I wouldn't um, myself accept the premise that there isn't any sort of obvious difficulty um, in this area. I mean, to take, take a common law example where one is negotiating, when one is appointing an estate agent to sell your house. Is what, the, the proposition that when that state agent is stipulating for their terms of business, they already owe you a fiduciary's obligation of full and frank disclosure. So they perhaps ought to tell you, well, we charge 3%, but you go down to Knight Frank and they charge you one and a half. Um, well, it, it may be that, that my, my Lord would say that's what ought to happen, but one struggles to believe is actually what does happen. Well, doesn't um, Kelly and Cooper say that it's not the case? Mm, well, yes, um, yes. Uh, and in specific, I'm going to come to Kelly, and specifically in respect of solicitors. We have the um, we have what the Marshal of the Royals, Lord Newberger, says in in, in Motto and Trafigura as well. Yes, although Motto and Trafigura mm. is a rather it's difficult not a case because yeah. it doesn't actually. I mean, it's it's a it's great a, dictum which, when you read it quickly, you think is absolutely conclusive, but actually it isn't. Well, he clearly isn't addressing this particular conundrum, and I, <laughs> I, I accept that. Mm. Yes, I mean, it, it, no, no, I, I have to say it's a, a conundrum which I might have deployed it with some confidence in front of. I don't mean a disrespect in front of the district judge, but I can quite see that when it is looked into, it, it can't be a complete answer because it's simply not wrestling with the issues of... of but, but, we, but nevertheless, we do say that the underlying sort of commercial points that Lord Newberger is making do translate. Well, I mean, I think I Lord Newberger is making exactly yes. the same point I've made Indeed. to you. Yeah. Yes. I mean, here it's the difference between a commercial lawyer and a trust lawyer. A trust lawyer <laughs> would start from the proposition that... You, there isn't anything wrong about having this very defined relationship uh, which puts you under very 
a great obligation, but you can still charge if you go through all the hoops. The commercial lawyer says, no, um, if you sign up, you pay. And, and I, I do think that is the dichotomy here. But for myself, I find it difficult to see in black and white terms why a fiduciary duty, where the fiduciary duty starts and finishes. It does not start and finish, as Herstanger shows you, and my lord pointed out why, at the point of retainer. So where does it start and finish? Yes. And, and I know that my lord, Lord Newberger, did sort of say that it starts and finishes, if, if that's what, how he's to be interpreted at the mm. point of retainer. But that is slightly too simplistic. So we need something a bit more sophisticated. And that's what I'm struggling for help with. Yes. Well, sh shall we? Shall we see if I can, can give you some help? It's uh, two o'clock. Yes, I'm happy for you to take till two o'clock. Should we just look at Kelly and Cooper just in the meantime? Yes, so certainly. We can go away yes. and mull it over. Yeah. So that is. Um, <coughs> it's the lovely Bermudian case. It I is. Mean, right? uh, which does involve state agents. Yeah. So it's um, tab nine for those using the hard copy. So it's in that volume one. Um, and uh, the, uh, I was going to go straight to the, the the core text, unless it would help for me to introduce the case through the head note. So um, the the key the key passages are sidelined, in fact, um, beginning um, in Lord Brown Wilkinson's um, opinion at the bottom of um, one two nine of the hard copy numbering. Two and three. Yeah. Um, so he begins, obviously he's dealing with a fiduciary relationship between principal and agent. He says, like every other contract, the rights and duties of the principal and agent are dependent upon the terms of the contract between them, whether expressed or implied. It's not possible to say that all agents owe the same duties to their principal. It's always necessary to have regards to the express or implied terms of the contract. And he cites um, and he cites uh, both steps. Um, and then they come on to fiduciary duty at the foot of 130 by marginal F. A similar consideration is applied to the fiduciary duties of agents. The existence and scope depends on the terms on which they are acting. And he cites Lord Wilberforce giving the um, opinion of the Privy Council in um, New Zealand's Netherlands. Um, mm -hmm. And the old Privy cites the then recent Phipps and Boardman. But, but this, uh, in hospital products, the famous dictum you know, the contract has to mould itself to the fiduciary duties. That, yes. we, we all get that. What does it mean here? <laughs> well, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that that isn't you know, a, a, a multiple type problem. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that it's, uh, that it's necessarily easy. But I, mean, what, you know, I think all, all one can really take it is, 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 a, is a launching pad. The, one can't have any um, sort, of, um, uh, sort of theological <clears throat> theological approach that because you become a fiduciary, uh, um, that, that can be completely divorced between the, the, from the terms on which you're appointed as such. Because as, 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 as um, His Honour um, Justice Mason says in that case, um, <clears throat> it's the contractual foundation uh, which is all important because it's the contract that regulates the basic um, uh, rights and liabilities. Um, and, the, and as your Lordship just said, if the fiduciary relationship exists, it must accommodate itself to the terms of the contract. Um, and that is that is what it really is that sort of approach which is underpinning our proposition. Um, uh, um, that um, while you're negotiating the terms of the contract, you're negotiating the terms on which you're willing to accept the appointment from which the fiduciary duties are created. Because we all know that you, you you're not a um, you, you don't have fiduciary duties because you're a fiduciary. You're a fiduciary because you, you know, the, the, the well known the well known observation of Lord Justice Millet. So, I mean, ultimately, um, if, if the fiduciary duty flows out of a contractual relationship, then, then the fiduciary duty is created and, 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 and regulated by that relationship. And, if the fiduciary, and therefore, if that, 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 that sort of commencement instrument of your relationship from which the duties flow creates a right to remuneration, we say that in, in, in terms of stipulating for those rights, you are not at that point uh, I'm, I'm stipulating you know, as somebody who already owes the fiduciary duties of total loyalty, disclosure, and such like. Um, and I, I appreciate that my lord, uh, Lord Justice Nuji, has, has, has essentially put to me that I'm, I'm, I'm creating a phantom in saying that creates difficulty. 
I do say it is quite difficult for, for parties to be having a commercial negotiation about the terms on, will, on which they're willing to accept a fiduciary appointment. If in the course of that negotiation, negotiating duty they already have all the obligations which they in due course would assume if they accepted the appointment. Can I be sure? Uh, I think there's two points and I, I'm, I'm not entirely clear in my mind the distinction between them. One, one is a, a timing point which is until you've become a solicitor you, have, you don't have any duty. But the other I think is a slightly different point which is when you're negotiating for your own fees, you obviously can't be acting in the interest solely of the client because you have your own interest exactly. in this, and that's inevitable from yes. the nature of a negotiation. Now, those, I think, are different points illustrated, as my Lord said, by the fact that you can owe certain obligations right from the outset of the inception of the, the relationship, um, the obligation not to take a secret profit is one which is there right from the start. Yeah. Whereas the, the the fact you're negotiating for yourself is not a timing point at all because... Oh, no, they're different. Yes. They're, they're different points. Now, now I, I think you're running both points, but it, it may be that, that, that one is better than the other. Maybe they're both good, maybe they're both bad. But yes. I, well, I, think, I think they do need to be addressed, or I would find it helpful if they were addressed yes. separately. But I mean, the, po the point about secret commissions, her saying the point, and that by definition that can't be part of a negotiation process between because two it's, parties it's a secret. Right? legitimately representing their own interests in the context of that uh, contractual negotiation because it's effectively a form of, of fraud. Yes, indeed. Um, so it lies outside that negotiation process and that may be the explanation and I think that's the point that my Lord's putting to you. But perhaps you'd like to think about it. And, and the other point you might like to think about is this very vexed question of good faith. Uh, we all know when this case gets to the Supreme Court, which may or may not do, um, some members of the Supreme Court will be very concerned about the question of whether a duty of good faith might apply within this relationship, and if so, how. And I would be helped by any submissions you have to make on authorities emanating from the Supreme Court recently on that and how they might be said to be applicable and can be, um, if, if applicable, distinguished because it, it is exactly what I think we've all been saying. It, obviously you have to look at what is going on within the negotiation and on the one side, the solicitor is entitled to say, no, I want £110. And the client is entitled to say, I'm only going to pay £90. And the solicitor does not owe the client in that exchange any duty not to say that the solicitor wants more money for himself, herself. But you... I mean, I would certainly not think that there's a duty of good faith Mm. in that discussion just that simple discussion so where if there is a duty of good faith does it come that's in it. between yeah. negotiating parties so, and that's where the difficulty lies really isn't it because you've got on the one hand the, extre the one extreme is the Hearst hanger, the secret profit case the other extreme the, the example my lord's put you but it might be said and no doubt it will be said by Mr Kirby that, that, that this case this aspect if you like of the negotiation the failure to say, and by the way, the two thousand five hundred pounds will actually be, may very well be five times what you'll recover from the other side. That may be um, somewhere in the middle between the two extremes. Um, and 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 to take my example a little further, what if the solicitor says, "I want a thousand pounds an hour to run this personal injury claim, where you're likely to recover two thousand and five. 2,500, um, without saying that's the normal thing that solicitors charge, but impliedly suggesting that is the case and people wouldn't know, um, is that a breach of a duty of good faith or a fiduciary duty even to ask for it? Or is it just a conduct breach? Mm. Yeah. Same point, my learned friend, yeah. my, my lord's making. Okay, well, look, we've gone on far too long. 
Both of us too will start uh, yeah. just after two. Thank you. Thank you.